International Oration uh, by Dr. Carol Shields. So mm -hmm. I would be introducing her first mm -hmm. and then handing it over to her. Her oration is going to be for 30 minutes. We're not going to have any questions during the session. Okay. We would request all our uh, delegates and participants to mm -hmm. jot down their questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. So after Dr. Shields uh, finishes her talk, we would be presenting her uh, with a token of appreciation. Of course, that's going to be virtual for her oration. And then that would be followed by the talk by Dr. Arano, followed by Dr. Biswas. Mm -hmm. And I will be introducing each of the speakers just prior to their talk. Okay. And uh, at the end of it, the last talk would be by me. And okay. then we would be uh, inviting questions and taking the questions that are there in the chat. And then... Uh, at the, then we wrap up the session. So that's how we're planning to go about this uh, particular okay. session. Perfect. That sounds perfect, ma'am. So what I'll do is I will at uh, around 4.58, I will start off, uh, we'll go live and I'll start off with the conference. I'll quickly set the context in around one and a half minute of time and then hand it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, may I quickly check with you what is the duration of each speaker's talk, ma'am? Yeah, so uh, the oration is 30 minutes mm -hmm. and then each talk is 15 minutes. Perfect. So Perfect. our session is a uh, one hour, uh, I think 25 minutes. One hour, 25 minutes, yes. Yeah, and then that would leave us maybe, and then of course there would be some time for introductions and uh, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I think that we should be able to wrap up in the within the scheduled time. Okay, okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Okay. I 
और यहाँ से ये ऊपर से लेके के दो तीन मेंटल चेंजेस हैं और Hi, Mary. Good morning. Yeah. Professor Biswas, good morning. From good evening. Good, good morning to you, Prof. Yeah. Early morning to you. It's early morning to you? Yeah, Friday morning. Okay, Friday morning. Hi, Dr. Karam. Hi, Dr. Mary. Thanks for joining in. We'll be starting in 10 minutes from now, ma'am. Yes. Hey, good morning. Would, would it be possible for me to test my share screen? Absolutely. Feel free to do that, ma'am. Okay. I check my screen also that for me. Let him let her see his check out. Perfect. Is it working? Absolutely, it's working. Okay. Uh, do you have any videos to be played? Maybe you can check that as well. Uh no, no videos. Okay, perfect. Working well. Okay, good. Great. Dr. Mary, Dr. Biswas, would you also like to do I want to check my slide. Sure, sir. Please go ahead. Share screen. Is my slide seen? Yes, sir. We can see your slide. Okay. Perfect. Is moving. It is moving, sir. Okay, no problem. Okay, if I test mine too. Absolutely, ma'am. How is that? 
it's working uh, would you want to um, move it good okay perfect Good morning, Dr. Carol, Dr. Yes, Mary. Dr. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for making it this very early morning. <laughs> A pleasure. Good evening, Dr. Viswas. Good evening. Good evening. I welcome you all. Good evening. Thank you. Would any of you like to check your slides and presentations? We have, all three of us. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll be starting in just about a couple of minutes. We're getting settled here. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining in online and offline as well. We'll be starting in two minutes from now. Get your card in there. So I'll take a sip. 
to get yours? AV team, uh, we'll be going live two minutes prior. So I would request you to please go live by 4.58. I hope you're there with me. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the RP Center family, I welcome you all to the 55th RP Center Foundation Day celebrations. We're now commencing the ocular oncology session and are joined by our very distinguished speakers this evening, Dr. Carol Shields, Dr. Mary Arano, Dr. Jodin Mebiswas. It is my ultimate honor to welcome the first speaker of this session, Dr. Carol Shields, a global icon in ocular oncology. We're deeply grateful to her that she agreed to spare her precious time to deliver the RP Center International Oration Award uh, uh, at the same time as the Will's Eye Institute Annual Symposium. It's 6.30 a.m. in the morning in the U.S. And thank you, Dr. Shields, for being with us this very early morning. We really appreciate this very sweet gesture of yours. <clears throat> thank you. Can I have the first slide, please? Dr. Carol Shields is the Director of Ocular Oncology Service at the Wills Eye <coughs> Institute and Professor of Ophthalmology at the Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. She completed her residency in ophthalmology from Wills Eye Hospital in 1987. She followed this with a fellowship training in ocular oncology, ocular plastic surgery, and ophthalmic pathology. She's a member of numerous ocular oncology, pathology, and retina societies, and has delivered 57 named lectures in USA and abroad. She was the first elected president of the International Society of Ocular Oncology in 2013 to 15. In 2020, Dr. Shields was listed at number one in the ophthalmology power list. She serves on the editorial advisory board of 31 journals, including JAMA Ophthalmology, Retina, and many others. She is recipient of several professional <laughs> honors, including the Donders Award, the American Academy of Ophthalmology Lifetime Achievement Honor Award, and induction into the Academic All-American Hall of Fame in 2011. She has given over 850 lectureships and authored, co-authored 11 textbooks, 323 chapters in edited textbooks, and over 1,700 articles in major peer-reviewed journals. It is my proud privilege to welcome Dr. Shields to this session and request her to deliver the RP Center International Oration. Can you see my slides? Yes, ma'am. We can okay, see thank you. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to speak to you. I have no financial disclosures. And I'd like to talk to you about pediatric intraocular tumors, a 2022 update. These are some of our most difficult tumors. I mean, children can die from these tumors. For example, in these four illustrations, if the diagnosis is missed, the child will be dead in one year. In one other illustration, might be dead in 28 years. Another one of these can cause no death but blindness. And the final one leads to no death and no blindness. Imagine that you're faced with four children and you have to decide 
which one is the most serious and which one puts this child at risk. Well, in the upper left, we see retinoblastoma dead by one year if the, if the diagnosis is missed. On the bottom left, we see the chirpy-like familial adenomatous polyposis, RPE lesions, which could lead to colonic cancer and death at 28 years. In the upper right, we see no death, but possible blindness from iristromal cyst. And then in the bottom right, we see congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, which is unlikely to lead to death or blindness. So we have many different lesions to talk about. We have cysts that can occur in children, iris nevus and iris melanoma, choroidal nevus and melanoma, medulloepithelioma, RPE tumors, and we'll finish with retinoblastoma. And these tumors arise in specific locations within the eye. That's your first clue. Where is it located? For example, in the iris, we can see nevus, melanoma, and cysts. In the non-pigmented ciliary epithelium, we see medulloepithelioma. And of course, retinoblastoma occurs in the retina, RPE tumors in the RPE. And then in the choroid, we can see nevus and melanoma. <clears throat> Let's begin with iristromal cyst. This is a condition that can occur in kids, in very young kids, in newborn kids, as a cystic lesion arising in the iristroma that can enlarge and produce secondary glaucoma, uveitis, and loss of the eye. Here you see a larger iristromal cyst in a baby under anesthesia and one that we're aspirating. And that is the treatment of choice. If the cyst is enlarging and impacting the central vision, then we will aspirate it with fine needle aspiration biopsy. If these rupture, they can produce anterior uveitis and it's very bad, aggressive uveitis. The management is observation if they're off the central axis and look stable. Needle aspiration if they're getting bigger. If they recur after your needle aspiration, we do needle aspiration plus absolute alcohol wash of the cyst. In the past, we used mitomycin C and sometimes cryotherapy, but now it's an absolute alcohol wash under viscoat endothelial protection. Rarely, if ever, do we excise these because it is nearly impossible to get all the cyst wall out and then you're dealing with epithelial downgrowth if you leave part of the cyst wall. My rule of thumb is if a child comes in under the age of 10 years with an iristromal cyst, it's gonna be aggressive. If they're over the age of 10 years, it's less aggressive and we need less intervention. <clears throat> Here's one cyst that we did the alcohol wash on. Above, you can see the cyst within the iristroma. It's a clear cyst filled with fluid. And then we did the fine needle aspiration biopsy, alcohol wash, and below you can see the cyst collapsed with corectopia, a little bit of ectropion, but hey, that's better than having a cyst at risk for rupture. This little child came all the way from Norway with severe photophobia. The doctors in Norway had managed the iristromal cyst with aspiration, but it kept coming back. So they sent the, the child to see us. And this child had a large cyst seen here on ultrasound biomicroscopy. And we aspirated the cyst and washed it with alcohol to sclerose the epithelial lining of the cyst. And subsequent to that, cataract surgery was done. And here she is a few months later following cyst aspiration and scler sclerosis with no photophobia and able to open her eye and to see. But you might note, she does have exotropia because of the amblyopia. Now cysts can occur in the iristroma as we just discussed or on the posterior surface of the iris called IPE cysts. We tend to not have to intervene with these types of cysts. They can produce a bulge in the iristroma shown here on gonioscopy and it's from cysts lining the posterior surface of the iris. Occasionally, these cysts can be in the pupillary margin as shown in this case. And you can see on anterior segment OCT, the nodular cysts at the pupillary margin. 
these are particularly worrisome because these are the only IPE cysts that can be associated with systemic disease. This disease, aortic dissection, and this patient had aortic dissection and almost died from it. I've seen now three such cases of pupillary margin cysts with aortic dissection. It's a mutation that leads to both the cysts and the dissection. So enough about cysts. Let's move on to solid lesions in the iris. Iris nevus and iris melanoma. Iris nevus tends to be small. Occasionally it can be sectoral. It usually involves less than three clock hours and it usually remains stable. <clears throat> Sometimes we call iris nevus sector iris melanocytosis. And here's an example of sector iris melanocytosis in a blue iris in a young kid. And this needs to be followed because it has a small risk for melanoma. Now, iris melanoma, on the other hand, tends to be larger than iris nevus, or it tends to grow or produce hyphema. Uh, so it's important to keep a watch on iris melanoma. Also, we've noted that it can seed. There is another condition called iris depigmentation. This can be a sign of Wardenberg's syndrome, or it can occur spontaneously without that disease. We've seen a few cases of this just even recently where the child will have a brown iris, but a sector of depigmentation. Now we've looked at iris melanoma in 317 children and adults. And we found that iris melanoma is rare of all uveal melanoma. Involvement in the iris only occurs in 4%. So it's very uncommon place for melanoma to develop. But iris melanoma in children tends to be smaller with less seeding, lower secondary glaucoma, and there's no difference in the incidence of metastasis or death based on age. And metastatic disease with iris melanoma at five years was 5%, at 10 years, almost 10%, and at 20 years, 11%. So it's lower than we see with choroidal melanoma. But here are some cases of iris melanoma in children. You can see plate A. This was a young girl from Boston. She actually had a very extensive melanoma. You can see it at eight o'clock in the angle, but look over here at three o'clock. There's a, a second melanoma. Well, really it was the same melanoma. They were connected by angle infiltration. We did plaque radiotherapy to the ent entire anterior segment She's about 12 years out and she's doing beautifully with tumor reg regression. Below in C, you see another iris melanoma that had documented growth. And in that case, we were able to surgically resect that tumor. <clears throat> Let's move to the back of the eye, choroidal nevus and choroidal melanoma. Yes, nevine melanoma can occur in children and I'll show you cases. So I usually tell our residents and fellows Listen, if a lesion is under two millimeters in thickness, it's probably a nevus. And if it's over three millimeters in thickness and it's pigmented, it's probably a melanoma. But what about those between two and three millimeters in thickness? This is where we use risk factors. So it's when, when you have obvious nevus, small, and obvious melanoma, large, you can make the differentiation. But between two and three millimeters, we use risk factors. And these risk factors, we remember with a mnemonic, two fine, small ocular melanoma doing imaging. And this is mostly for lesions three millimeters or less in thickness, like this lesion we're looking at here. And if you look at this lesion with obvious orange pigment, and for those of you who have real good sight, you can see there's a pocket of subretinal fluid. And we look at these risk factors, TFSOM, where T stands for thickness over two millimeters, F for fluid, S for symptoms of vision loss, O for orange pigment, M for melanoma hollow, and DIM for diameter greater than five millimeters, all done on imaging with ultrasound, OCT, autofluorescence. We image everybody with nevus, of course, with melanoma, but we do it for nevi because we wanna find risk factors. This patient had five of six risk factors with a greater than 50% chance 
for growth within five years. This lesion was labeled as melanoma, not nevus, even though it was quite small. And we use these risk factors to detect small melanoma early. So here's a 15 year old boy. He came in with vision loss. He has this mass of about six millimeters in thickness. Are we really gonna watch this? No, this is a melanoma. We performed fine needle aspiration biopsy, confirmed it cytologically, and then did genetics, genetic testing on him. And he had low risk melanoma. He was treated with plaque radiotherapy. You can see the chorioretinal scarring surrounding the radiation. The tumor regressed and on ultrasound, it's nearly a completely flat scar with clean margins. Unfortunately, it's in the middle of his vision, but his life is saved. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about genetics. A very important study came out in Cancer Cell 2018 from the National Institute of Health the National Cancer Institute. They sampled 80 cases looking for genetics. <clears throat> they looked at a multi-platform molecular analysis and came up with four distinct groups of uveal melanoma based on genetics, group class A, class B, class C, and class D with increasing risk for metastatic disease. So now we don't look at melanoma and say, oh, you might get METs. We look at melanoma based on genetics and we say you're at low risk for metastasis or you're at high risk if you're class C and class D. We published this in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology 2021, 10 year outcomes in over a thousand cases, looking at tumor genetics in a thousand cases, according to the Cancer Genome Atlas classification. Again, it's four groups based on genetics. Again, class A, B, C, D. And we found class A had at five years only 4% risk and at 10 years only 6% risk for metastasis. Class A and B were low risk for metastatic disease. But look at class C and look at class D. At five years, 60% risk for metastatic disease and at 10 years, six, greater than 60%. These are high risk C and D for metastatic disease and these patients deserve adjuvant therapy. So this little boy who was 15 years old had vision loss from the tumor when he came in and then from the radiation, but luckily his genetics showed group A, very low risk. His 10 year risk for metastatic disease is only 6%. So that's good news for him. Now keep in mind, ocular melanocytosis is a congenital condition that can lead to the development of melanoma. I just treated a patient yesterday with that condition, melanocytosis and melanoma. The melanocytosis can occur on the skin, sclera, uvea, orbit, meninges, and even the roof of the mouth in the palate. There's a one in 400 chance for uveal melanoma. And the melanocytosis does not have to be diffuse and involve the entire choroid. It could be sectoral as shown here. You can see down below is sector melanocytosis. Up above is the child's normal pigmentation. This little boy came in with heterochromia and you can see he had a brown pupillary reflex. He was only six years old. He had ocular melanocytosis that led to melanoma at age six years. He came to a nucleation. Now we've looked at melanoma in over 8,000 cases and melanoma in children tend to be smaller, tend to be more often in the iris and kids tend to do better. They only have a 9% nine year nine percent risk for metastatic diseases at 10 years compared to adults where it's a 28% risk and death is less in children. And we all often wondered why that was, but now we know children tend to have fewer genetic mutations compared to adults. So we, we test everyone for mutations in chromosomes three, six, and eight. These mutations are the strongest predictor of metastatic disease and younger patients and smaller tumors have fewer mutations. Okay, enough about melanocytic tumors. Let's say a few words about medulloepithelioma. <clears throat> 
This is a rare intraocular tumor. We just had a case in a 29 year old man, but it, this usually occurs in children at an average age of four years. It's embryonal. That means it's present at birth and it's usually detected a few years after birth. It's a fleshy mass in the ciliary body, often with cysts. And that's how you're gonna make the diagnosis. You'll do a UBM and you'll look for the ciliary body mass with cysts. This can produce leukocoria, cataract, and glaucoma. What type of glaucoma? Neovascular glaucoma. Beware NVG in a kid. You must rule out medulloepithelioma. So this has a triad of features. It produces cataract in a child, a lens notch as shown here, and neovascular glaucoma. Get a UBM to rule out medulloepithelioma before you do that trabeculectomy or put in that MIGS. You wanna be sure there's no tumor in the eye. Along with Swadi Kaliki, we looked at both the Indian and the American uh, experience with ciliary body medulloepithelioma. We only had 41 cases. You would think we would have many more, but this is a rare tumor. We only see medullo in our practice once or twice a year, whereas we see retinoblastoma every week. In this analysis of 41 eyes, we found fluorid NVI was seen in many cases, over 50%. The lens can be subluxated. The tumor can grow into the iris and form a mass. And here is the classic UBM finding, a cyst. A cyst within this solid mass is strongly suggestive of medullo. And here is a retrolental neoplastic membrane. Medullo can grow a, along the scaffolding of the hyloid. And this is all tumor growing behind the lens and you can actually image it on intersegment OCT or ultrasound biomicroscopy. Most of these eyes come to a nucleation. In rare cases, we can save them with plaque radiotherapy. And here are some of the heteroplastic elements. Sometimes we find cartilage in the tumor, sometimes brain, muscle, and even rhabdomyoblasts. I'm gonna show you another variant of medulloepithelioma. It, it isn't always a solid mass. Sometimes it's just wispy veils in the vitreous in a young child. This was a five-year-old girl who had chronic unilateral uveitis. She bounced around during the pandemic in the Midwest of the US. She had neovascular glaucoma. She had a tube shunt placed. They couldn't figure out why she wasn't responding to steroids and, either, and even biologics. She was on adalibumab. After one year with no improvement, she was sent to us. Ultrasound showed fibrosis in her vitreous. And we did a UBM. And we saw this neoplastic membrane wrapping around the front and the back of her lens and a small mass in the ciliary body with cysts. We were very worried about medulloepithelioma but really didn't see an obvious mass. Well, we enucleated the eye because we were very worried. And you can see this veil-like structure, wispy structure arising from the ciliary body. They'd even put PRP in the eye for the NVI, thinking it might've been from ischemia posteriorly, but not at all. Medullo tends to produce VEGF and that's the cause for the NVI. You have to get rid of the tumor to get rid of the NVI. She had a tube shunt in and showed this lacy mass, which proved to be medulloepithelioma with pools of mucin, Flexner, Wintersteiner rosettes, classic diagnosis of medulloepithelioma. Luckily, the eye was enucleated and her tube shunt had no cells within it. So we think she's going to be okay. But I warn you, when you see NVI in a child or NVG, you've got to think tumor, 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 retinoblastoma, juvenile xanthogranuloma, or medulloepithelioma. And that's totally different from NVG in adults. We always think vasculopathic in adults. 
diabetes, CRVO, ocular ischemic syndrome. So in kids, it's tumor. In adults, it's vasculopathic. Now I'll say a few quick words on RPE tumors because these occur in kids. They're picked up in kids and it's important to know the difference. We have chirpy and a bunch of other lesions that I'll talk about. I think all of us could identify congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium as solitary with lacunae and the surrounding non-pigmented halo, and then with multifocal appearance as bear tracks. Neither of these are associated with systemic conditions. However, there is a condition that looks like chirpy, but it's called chirpy-like lesions associated with familial adenomatous polyposis. Some people call them POFL, pigmented ocular fundus lesions with FAP. And these are irregular, pisciform, they have a fish tail, and they might even be just one or a few tiny black dots. They are highly suggestive of FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis or Gardner's syndrome. And these patients are at risk for colon cancer by age 28 to 30 years. Here's one case that we published in a patient who already had colon cancer. Uh, he was a 36 year old man and he was diagnosed with colon cancer at age 15 years. He came to see us later at age 36 and wouldn't you know it, on fundus photography, but better seen on fundus autofluorescence, he had over 10 of these RPE markers. I wish we had seen him when he was five because we could have picked up and gotten colonoscopy and hopefully prevented the colon cancer. Now there's another unusual RPE lesion called torpedo maculopathy. <clears throat> We think this is congenital, it's usually depigmented, and it's usually right at this location in the temporal macular region, or sort of close to that. These patients have no systemic associations. Their vision is usually good, <clears throat> and this generally does not enlarge. It's usually one, and that's all, and it remains stable. We published on why this happens. This occurs in a special site in the macula when the eye's developing that leads to the torpedo look. You can read our paper. Another RP tumor is called R congenital simple hamartoma of the RPE. This is a small, it looks like an ink dot in the parafovial region. Sometimes there'll be feeder vessels. Fluorescein shows it to be hypofluorescent. It remains stable, it doesn't turn into adenoma, and the vision's usually good. And then there's combined hamartoma, the retina and RPE. This can be associated with systemic conditions, especially NF2. I've seen it with neurofibromatosis type two in a four-year-old, so you gotta get checkup for that. And the management is usually observation. I mean, if OCT shows the retina to be mostly intact, you might consider vitrectomy and membrane peeling. Here's one that we would not peel. This has completely disorganized retina. We would just leave that vitro-retinal traction alone. Here's another one that we would not peel. This is an old time domain OCT showing complete disorganization of the retina. And, <clears throat> and we would leave that alone too. And the final RPE lesion, ERPED, unilateral RPE dysgenesis. This was just recently described by Solomon Cohen in Paris, France. It's a congenital RPE defect that has porcupine-like margins and, or some people say, we've said fringe-like margins. It's completely hypoautofluorescent. It's usually stable, but now there have been reports that patients can develop CNVM and or adenoma from this, we think, congenital defect, but we're not sure it's congenital. Here's the autofluorescence. You can see the RPE is very sick at the site where this occurs. <clears throat> Last topic that we're gonna talk on is retinoblastoma. So for those of you who are sleeping, wake up. This is a really important topic and we only have a few minutes to review it. 
This is the most common intraocular malignancy of childhood, one in 15,000 live births. And we like to talk ab about retinoblastoma in terms of germline or somatic mutation. We used to say hereditary or non-hereditary. Now we say germline or somatic mutation. There's a new classification as of 2004 for retinoblastoma. It's called the International Classification of RB. It's groups A, B, C, D, E. And I highlight the letters. This is actually how I remember it. A for small, B for bigger than three millimeters or with subretinal fluid in the macula. I always think Big Mac with cheese, even though no one eats those anymore because they're not healthy for you. C for contained seeds, localized seeds. D for diffuse seeds, whether they be vitreous or subretinal seeds. And E for extensive, more than 50% of the globe, filled NVI or opaque media. In the past, we used to treat retinoblastoma with a nucleation, external beam radiation or plaque radiation, but not that anymore. Nowadays, it's all about chemo, intravenous, intraarterial, intravitreal, intraaqueous chemotherapy. Every child gets genetic testing and genetic counseling. Yes, we still do a nucleation, but that's less than 5% of the cases that we see. It's cases that have really advanced disease like this with large exophytic tumor. And when we enucleate, we always harvest fresh tumor and send it for genetic testing. Here's one eye that came to enucleation. This young boy came from Atlantic City, New Jersey. He had a large tumor. We removed the eye, no view of his retina, hydroxyapatite implant placed. You can see muscles attached. He did very well. Problem. As I've learned from Dr. <coughs> Hanavar and Dr. Chala from India, the job is not done when you do the enucleation. You must look at the pathology. And here we see he has post-laminar invasion of the retinoblastoma into the optic nerve. This child needs chemo or he's going to develop metastatic disease. We published on this post-enucleation adjuvant chemotherapy for high-risk retinoblastoma. What is high risk? Well, that's when the tumor invades post-laminar into the optic nerve or invades into the choroid greater than three millimeters or any degree of anterior chamber or optic nerve, uh, any degree of optic nerve or choroidal invasion. And we always give adjuvant chemotherapy with good results. Most of these children survive. Now, there's different ways to give chemotherapy. Intravenous chemotherapy, which Dr. Chala gives in India, uh, is usually with three agents, vincristinotoposide and carboplatin, and it works. It's very effective. We use it every day here in Philadelphia. Intraarterial chemotherapy, with, which Dr. Chala also uses, we use here also every week. We use melphalan and topotecan. It's given via the femoral artery up to the eye. And then we can inject into the eye if there's vitreous seeds, melphalan or topotecan. And if the child's older, sometimes we can give intraarterial chemotherapy into the radial artery. That's safer than the femoral artery. So let's look at intravenous chemotherapy. This is a child with three retinoblastomas in the right eye. We give the chemotherapy and one month later, wow tumor regression. Look at that. Now we see the fovea. We consolidate the tumor with TTT. And then you can see immediately after TTT, we have the small tumors turn right white. The calcified tumor doesn't really change. And then six months after giving monthly chemotherapy and TTT, tumors all regress. This child had 27 division. This child would not have had much vision if we irradiated. So we started with intravenous chemotherapy back in the early 1990s, and we first published on 250 eyes that we treated, and we said we're getting success based on the international classification of retinoblastoma. A, B, and C do well. D and E don't do so well, but we still get results. But now in 2020, we've updated our outcomes in 
almost a thousand eyes that we've treated with intravenous chemotherapy. Again, we use this every day. So we have almost a thousand eyes. We published this in BJO 2020. And we looked at group A, B, C, D, and E at one year, the blue column, and A, B, and C, we have 96% success in saving the eyes or better. And then D, we have 78% success and E, almost 50% success at one year. Now, what happens at year two? Because they're not on chemo. They're on nothing at year two. Hey, it still holds. They don't get recurrence. It's rare to see recurrence. Same for year three, year five, year 10, and year 20. So that six months of chemo that we give in the first year of life holds them for 20 years in most cases. So I always tell our patients what we see at year three, you're likely to keep at year 20. Now, our main concern here is to save their life. And in some cases, in order to save their life and their eye, we have to give additional intraarterial chemotherapy and do plaque radiotherapy. We usually go to IAC first because it's less complications than plaque radiotherapy. We go to plaque radiotherapy second. And IAC is used overall about 17% in plaque and about 19% of the kids who get intravenous chemotherapy. Intraarterial chemotherapy is a little bit more powerful than intravenous chemotherapy. Again, by the femoral or radial arteries. This is used for unilateral retinoblastoma. And we go right in, right near that pelvic bone where you see where we're pointing all the way up in the aorta to the carotid, internal carotid and squirt the chemo into the eye. And you can see the chemo poofs right into the eye. Here is the first child that we treated back in 2008. We've been using intraarterial chemotherapy now for 14 years. This first child has had wonderful tumor control and he still has vision in this eye. Both eyes had retinoblastoma. Overall success with IAC is 75%. That's what I tell the patients. Here's another child from the Midwest of the United States before and after showing how fast the tumor shrinks down and showing the retina flattening down. And another case before with total retinal detachment and after showing the calcified tumor and flat retina, maybe with some vision in the superior macular region. So we've looked at unilateral retinoblastoma comparing intravenous versus intraarterial chemotherapy. And if you look at ABC, we generally don't do IAC for group A. We do intravenous chemo for group A. And ABC does just the same with intravenous versus intraarterial chemo. But it's group D and group E that do better with intraarterial chemotherapy, especially if it's unilateral retinoblastoma. So we tend to treat advanced retinoblastoma with IAC. And now that we're injecting the vitreous with chemotherapy and the aqueous, we're saving more and more eyes. And also if you compare IAC versus IVC, intravenous chemotherapy, we get better control of solid tumor, subretinal seeds, and vitreous seeds with intraarterial chemotherapy than with intra venous chemotherapy, but there's a role for both. And this is significantly better control. This was for unilateral retinoblastoma. So for unilateral retinoblastoma, intraarterial chemotherapy wins. It, it's a little better than intravitreous chemotherapy in our hands. And this is why we choose IAC for unilateral retinoblastoma, because most of these eyes are really advanced. Now I'll finish with some comments on vitreous chemotherapy. We tend to inject melphalan and or topotecan for vitreous seeds. Here you see the chemotherapy drawn up in a TB syringe injected through the pars plana. As we come out, we cryo the site where we inject. This is a very anxiety producing treatment because you know we're injecting chemo into a baby's eye. I, I always think twice before I do it. 
Well, anyways, here's one eye that needed it. You can see all the vitreous seeds surrounding the tumor still there. So we injected and we cleaned up those vitreous seeds and we have on OCT, a normal foveal contour. This kid has every reason to have good vision. Jasmine Francis did a nice analysis, a collaboration of 10 retinoblastoma centers to look at the safety of injecting chemo into eyes with vitreous seeds. And she found in 3,500 injections from 10 retinoblastoma centers that not one child had extraocular tumor seeding. So this is really important. It's a safe procedure if you do it correctly. Now, if a kid gets anterior chamber seeds, we inject topotecan. We don't inject melphalan into the anterior segment. Why not? Because melphalan is really toxic and I don't want to watch the cornea become cloudy. So I prefer topotecan. And we just give a little dose. Here's one case that was published in the literature with aqueous seeds. And this is after topotecan in the anterior chamber. It works. It cleans it up real fast. So nowadays, retinoblastoma treatment is totally targeted. Chemo, chemo, and more chemo to control the patient's life, save the eye, and save vision. And for those of you really interested, we wrote this article in Current Opinion and Ophthalmology on targeted retinoblastoma with the goals of number one, save life, number two, save eye, and number three, save vision. So in the US, we have 95% survival, and this is how kids present with leukocoria, but not so around the world. In Africa, and I know some parts of India, children still come with very advanced disease with more difficult, more challenging problems requiring very high uh, education, high level of retinoblastoma care, such as you received there with uh, Dr. Chala. And we do see metastatic disease in the United States. Um, Jonathan Liu looked at a few centers in the US and we found there's still a 4% rate of metastatic disease post-nucleation in the United States. But most of these were advanced cases that had invasion of the optic nerve. We always tell the parents, you know, the first year, second year, we still have to watch closely for metastatic disease. And we do see metastasis in kids with intraarterial chemotherapy. We did a big study where we had six centers contribute all their cases that received intraarterial chemotherapy, and we found three deaths from intra, following intraarterial chemotherapy, again, in really advanced eyes where there was relatively poor follow-up. So a child with retinoblastoma can still die after intraarterial chemotherapy. So this is dangerous disease, retinoblastoma. And I just hope all of you will uh, be sure to remember to have your patients seen at a good retinoblastoma center. I'm just gonna say a few comments about retinocytoma. This is a rare variant of retinoblastoma that is benign. It doesn't really grow. It looks like it's been treated and we mostly watch these patients. But we did an analysis that was just published this year. We looked at retinocytoma in 78 tumors and found that at five years, 7% of these tumors grow and at 10 years, 11% can grow. So these patients need to be followed uh, for growth long-term because it's an 11% rate of growth by 20 years. Here's one that grew and we actually saved this eye with intraarterial chemotherapy. You can see the retinocytoma benign part surrounding the active central retinoblastoma. Follow these patients twice yearly for life. <clears throat> and we've also done studies looking at likelihood of unilateral retinoblastoma being germline mutation. If a child is zero to three months of age and they come to you with one tumor in one eye, there's a 60% chance they're going to have unilateral retinoblastoma. So you really need to follow these kids closely. 
the chance lessons in the first year. I'm like, extremely oh, sorry to interrupt you, um, uh, Dr. Carroll. Um, since we are running so, short of time, we have already okay. exceeded the time. Okay, I'll skip to my last slide then. My last slide is here. I will summarize. So over the past, which I hope was uh, informative uh, time with you, we talked about uh, iris stromal and iris pigment epithelial cysts, nevus and melanoma, choroidal nevus and melanoma, medullo, and some RPE tumors and retinoblastoma. So in summary, this was a overview of pediatric intraocular tumors, and I hope it helps you in your management of uh, children with uh, intraocular lesions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. It was wonderful. Back to Dr. Bhavna. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. That was a brilliant presentation and extremely insightful talk. Uh, we all gained a lot. Thank you for sharing your decades of precious clinical experience with us. We really wish we could go on and on hearing you. It's never enough. Uh, and uh, we're really grateful that you made it today morning on a very busy day. I know you have to rush to the Wills Oncology Symposium. Everyone must be waiting for you. Uh, Dr. Carol has to leave. So if there are any questions for her, we may take them quickly. Uh, if there's Bhavna, anybody in the audience or in the, among the panelists or Bhavna, any delegates who would like to ask any question. I have received a question in the chat for Dr. Shields. And the question is, what is the procedure for alcohol wash? Type in concentration of alcohol. Is it done under direct visualization or opt guided? Yes. Yeah, so when we use alcohol wash for iris stromal cyst, we use 100% alcohol. And we have a special tripod injector. So we inject, we enter through the cornea into the cyst, right where the cyst is adherent to the cornea. We enter. We aspirate the cyst and using this special tripod, we leave the needle in the cyst and inject the alcohol, leave it in for one minute. It turns the cyst white and then we aspirate it. So the needle never leaves the cyst. It, the, the alcohol is injected through one portion of the tripod and aspirated through the other portion of the tripod. This is sort of a dangerous procedure and it's always done under viscote protection of the endothelium. Uh, sure. Shields, I have a question for you. So um, uh, in your experience for resistant intervitreal seeds, does changing the chemotherapeutic agent help, like shifting from melphalan to topotican? So I know in India, there has been some complications with melphalan producing anterior uveitis, cataract, RPE alterations. And we see the same in America, maybe not so much, um, we tend to use melphalan because it's so powerful. But if the child has good central vision, I usually start with topotecan because it's gentler on the eye and the retina. And if I don't get a good response, I'll go move on to melphalan. Um, we don't shift melphalan to topotecan back and forth. So we don't shift back and forth. And if it's really advanced disease, we sometimes use both agents. Thank you, Dr. Sheets. Oh, yeah, there's one more question from the audience. Um, Dr. Anita Sethi is here. Yeah. Dr. Carol, that was really, truly a wonderful lecture. Um, just a quick question. Uh, we've just started doing IAC at our center. And um, I just wanted to know how many cycles do we give? I mean, do we just keep going on or is there some end point? Sure. So with IAC, you know, uh, the, the drugs we're using are very dangerous. Melphalan is very dangerous drug. No pediatric oncologist wants to ever give a kid melphalan because that can cause bone marrow failure. So we have to be really careful with that drug. We generally tell the parents we're going to give three to four doses of IAC, then be done. Uh, and if you don't get a good response by three to four doses, then either the drugs aren't getting to the eye or uh, the retinoblastoma might be chemo resistant. 
uh, or the eye should just be enucleated. Um, we give up to, up to six to eight doses, but we never give more than eight doses. You know, in, men, in boys, if you give more than eight doses, you're risking sterility uh, in boys because the melphalan is very toxic to the sperm. Yeah, there's one more question. Thank you, Dr. Carol, for a wonderful presentation. Ma'am, I would also like to know that the tripod that you use for alcohol injection, is it commercially available? Yes, so we, go, we get it from our anesthesia department. Okay. So they have this, and we've published on this. It, uh, we actually took a picture of the tripod so everyone can see it. And this tripod allows you to aspirate from one side and inject from the other side so that the needle in the cyst can stay in the cyst because you don't want to be removing that needle. Um, you want it to stay stable in the cyst. And um, we, the title of that uh, paper, it was in JAMA Ophthalmology on 15 children with iris stromal cyst, and it was called alcohol sclerosis of iris stromal cyst. So we have a picture of the tripod and a picture of exactly how we do it. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am, for the detailed. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Carroll, before you leave, as a token of our appreciation for delivering the RP Center International Oration, may we present you with this plaque virtually, uh -huh. and we will have it shipped to you, to your center very soon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chala. And thank you for all your education to me. I learned from you. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Thank you for your kind words. We now move on to our next distinguished speaker this evening, morning at Harvard, where she is from, Dr. Mary Arano. She's assistant professor of ophthalmology at the retina and ocular oncology service at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Center, Howard Medical School. Dr. Arano completed her undergrad studies at Cornell University with honors and distinction. She received ophthalmology residency and subspecialty fellowship training in ophthalmic oncology at the Coli Institute at Cleveland Clinic. She completed a second fellowship in medical retina at the National Eye Institute of the National Institutes of Health. She was also faculty member at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center in Baltimore, Maryland. She developed a full service eye cancer program at the Johns Hopkins and implemented several leading edge techniques for the delivery of chemotherapy. Her clinical interests include the treatment of ocular melanoma, retinoblastoma, lymphoma, and other intraocular tumors and conditions. She has published extensively and has contributed more than 40 book chapters on retinal and oncologic conditions. On behalf of RP Center family, it is my proud privilege to welcome Dr. Mary Arano. Thank you, Dr. Chala. Can you see my screen? Well, it's an honor to be invited to be here with you this evening and to speak with you about advances in uveal melanoma. I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. Uveal melanoma is the most common primary intraocular malignancy in adults. We know from data from the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program that its incidence is approximately 5.1 per million population in the United States. The incidence has remained constant over the past several decades and is roughly equal between males and females. We have some, seen some advances in treatment with the number of patients treated with enucleation largely reduced at this point, and most patients now receive eye sparing treatment with radiation, either plaque brachytherapy or proton beam irradiation. Despite advances in treatment, 
The five-year relative survival has remained constant around 80% over the past many decades. This is true not just in the United States, but worldwide where five-year relative survival rates are equal between different countries. And it's not just recent decades. If we look back more than a century ago, Ernst Fuchs from Austria in 1882 published his results stating that regardless of treatment, 18% of his patients developed fatal metastases. How then are we going to move the needle forward and improve outcomes for patients with uveal melanoma? Today, I wanna to talk about advances in this condition, specifically imaging and diagnosis, prognostication, therapy, clinical trials, and collaboration. Imaging and diagnosis. There's very little controversy over small flat choroidal nevus. Most experts would agree that we should photograph these and that patients should be surveyed on a regular basis. And the opposite end of the spectrum, large intraocular melanoma is generally straightforward in terms of diagnosis. If the tumor is large and anterior, you may see sentinel vessels. There may be a large mass visible through the pupil. And ultrasound may demonstrate classic features like a collar button or mushroom shaped tumor. But what about indeterminate or suspicious lesions? Dr. Shields reviewed clinical features that are more suggestive of small choroidal melanoma, including thickness greater than two millimeters, presence of orange pigment or lipofusin, absence of drusen, presence of subretinal fluid, development of interval growth, symptoms, and proximity to the optic nerve. We have seen some advances in our imaging that have allowed us to more accurately capture our findings and also to facilitate diagnosis. Standard color fundus photography offers a 30 degree view of the fundus. And even if you montage those images, you can achieve 75% 75, 75 degree coverage of the fundus. But more recent ultra wide field devices allow us to capture 200 degrees of the fundus in a single frame. And this is really useful for completely documenting tumors that are located more peripherally, both tumors and non tumors alike, like this peripheral benign congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. Ultrasonography can complement clinical findings and typically demonstrates a dome or a mushroom shaped tumor on B scan with low internal reflectivity on A scan. Fluorescein angiography can also be used with the newer ultra wide field systems and can demonstrate intrinsic vascularity within the tumor, highly suggestive of uveal melanoma. And endocyanine green angiography can also be used with the newer wide field systems and is superior at highlighting the choroidal circulation. Optical coherence tomography provides micron level resolution of the degree of subretinal fluid. It can show us the status of the fovea and is useful for documenting these features, both at diagnosis and in evaluating response to treatment. And the newer enhanced depth imaging um, modalities may be more accurate for measuring tumor thickness compared to ultrasonography. And it's also very useful as the IR images can highlight orange pigment or lipofusin, even when it's very difficult or subtle to detect clinically. Prognostication. The earliest prognostic indicators were really clinical features, and we have known this since the 1970s. Increasing basal diameter and tumor height are both associated with poor prognosis. We know from the collaborative ocular melanoma study that at 25 years, only 18% of small, but 59% of large tumors metastasize. Tumor location anterior to the equator, involvement of the ciliary body, and presence of extrascleral extension are both are all associated with poor prognosis. And in this landmark paper by the Shields team, increased risk of metastasis was demonstrated on a millimeter by millimeter basis in over 8,000 eyes. 
you can clearly see that size matters and the larger tumors are, the risk for metastasis increases at five, 10 and 20 years. And millimeter by millimeter, that risk increases at 10 years. Other early prognostic indicators are growth patterns. We know that diffuse tumors, those with a ring configuration, and those that demonstrate rapid growth are more likely to metastasize. Later on, we realized that there were histopathologic risk factors, such as cell type. We know that tumors that are epithelioid in nature tend to be more aggressive than their spindle cell counterparts. Presence of mitotic figures, uh, high numbers of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and extravascular matrix patterns all portend a poor prognosis. And then in more recent decades, we've been able to look beyond the histopathology and clinical features to take a deeper dive into the genetics of these tumors. The earliest studies in the 1980s recognized aberrations in chromosomes, particularly one, three, six, and eight. And among them changes in chromosome three particularly loss of one copy or the condition we call monosomy three is the most important. There are many different techniques for looking at the genetic aberrations within tumors. There are several commercially available tests, but the bottom line is that the um, expertise at the institution really guides the selection of the test and the treating physician will make this decision. We know that the procedure of biopsying these tumors is safe. In our own experience, um, looking at large uh, series of these tumors, there was a very small risk of developing vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment with needle biopsy. And other groups have found that to be similar to very low risk of vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment. And in looking at large numbers over long time periods, we have not seen uh, needle tract seeding of the tumor. We don't think this increases the risk of metastasis. Therapy. We have several options for treating uveal melanoma. Plaque brachytherapy is used most commonly. Some centers have access to proton beam irradiation and a handful of centers do endoresection, enucleation for larger tumors and a newer treatment I'm going to talk about, AU011. Plaque brachytherapy is generally in the United States, iodine-125 we use most frequently and ruthenium-106 in Europe and other countries. We have some, seen some advances in the designs of the plaques with slimmer lower profile models, uh, notches so that the plaque can be snugged up near the optic nerve and custom designs to treat ciliary body and iris tumors and other configurations. And that has just sort of expanded the realm of what we can treat with plaque brachytherapy. We've also learned to do intraoperative ultrasonography because the plaque can be viewed very nicely once it's situated, and we can confirm that it completely covers the tumor for optimal response. I work at a center that uses proton beam irradiation, and this is a technique that uses ionizing radiation in the form of charged particles or protons. These travel in a straight line in order to minimize scatter. And like plaque brachytherapy, we have 95% local control rates in the eye. Um, we use a technique with transillumination to highlight the borders of the tumor, and then fiducial marker rings are sewn to the sclera surrounding the tumor to help guide the radiation. This is how the tantalum marker rings once they're, look once they're sewn down to the sclera. And then we meet on a weekly basis with the radiation oncologist and help them to develop their radiation plans. We can see exactly where the optic nerve and the fovea are, and we can see the isodose curve. So we know how much of the tumor is receiving 90%, 95%, 50%, 10%, et cetera. The patient goes for five uh, daily treatment fractions for a total dose of 70 gray and they sit in a, a chair that's like a slit lamp device and the head is immobilized using a mask. So we have excellent local control, either with plaque brachytherapy or proton beam irradiation, but the problem really is the side effects of radiation and the high risk of vision loss from radiation retinopathy. We have a newer, very exciting treatment. This is the first time that a pharmaceutical company has shown interest in our orphan disease with a treatment called AU011. This is a viral-like particle bioconjugate, 
and it selectively targets heparin sulfate proteoglycans, which are on the surface of the tumor. And it's activated um, with a light similar to photodynamic therapy. So first the medication is injected into the eye intravitreally, or now more recently we're doing suprachoroidal injections. We, uh, the, the results have just come out regarding the phase 1b2 trial using the intravitreal administration of AU011, and there's an ongoing phase two trial for the suprachoroidal administration. And the, the company demonstrated at 12 months that there was growth reduction of the tumor and preservation of vision at 71% of patients. There were no severe adverse events, and most of the side effects were tolerable. Uh, they included inflammation and elevated eye pressure that were manageable with topical therapy. Clinical trials. The good news is we're seeing an influx of clinical trials. If you look back to the 1990s, and if you went to clinicaltrials.gov and put in our disease, uveal melanoma, you would only find 17 matches for current or ongoing or enrolling trials uh, or those with closed results. And then in the early 2066, and then in, more, in the most recent decade, we have 98 matches. So there seems to be more interest in doing clinical trials. Now we've had some failures with earlier chemotherapies, missing endpoints um, in our studies, but there's also some good news. There have been some newer adjuvant treatments uh, like the study done at, at Wills with sunitinib and valproic acid. So we clearly need better adjuvant therapies for our patients, and then we need better therapies once patients develop metastases. We have some exciting news that Tibentifus was recently approved by the FDA for the treatment of patients who have metastatic uveal melanoma. This is a bispecific fusion protein, and this study showed that in 378 patients with metastatic uveal melanoma who were randomized either to Tibentifus or one of three standard therapies, the median overall survival was 21.7 months in those who received Tibentifus compared to only 16 months to those who received one of the controls. And I lastly just wanna point out how important collaboration is. We've seen increase in membership in our international society. We have revamped AJCC cancer staging manuals. We've had uh, international working days to talk about ways to move forward together. And there have been many other exciting collaborations like the Cancer Genome Atlas Project that Dr. Shields talked about, um, the European Ocular Oncology Group, the Collaborative Ocular Oncology Group, and of course our international society. I wanna talk about two really important papers from your RP Center, which are recent, and just show us how much we still need to learn about the biology of these tumors and the relevance to developing newer adjuvant and treatments for metastatic patients. So this was a, a recent paper looking at CREL and immunoexpression of CREL suggests that NF-kappa B pathway is active. And that's exciting because it's a potential target for anti-cancer therapy. And this paper, which was a collaboration uh, between ocular oncologists at at your institution and across the world, which may help to explain why these tumors are particularly resistant to immunotherapy. These authors noticed that increased tumor infiltrating, lymphocyte infiltration resulted in more aggressive tumors. It suppressed the immune response and inhibited the response to immunotherapy. So I think these collaborations, not just ocular oncologists, but working with pathologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and researchers internationally really helps us to build our understanding of where we're at with these tumors and where to go in the future. So in conclusion, multimodal imaging really helps us to document our findings and improves diagnostic accuracy. Prognostication is very important for risk stratification. We have newer treatment modalities being developed. There's been an expansion in clinical trials and collaboration is a worldwide effort. And I just want to end by saying what an honor it is to have this collaboration with Professor Bafna Chala uh, and being a co-editor with our forthcoming book, Global Perspectives in Ocular Oncology, with a special forward by Carol and Jerry Shields. This will be coming in the summer of 2022, and we're so appreciative to all of the authors who contributed to our book, many of whom are in the audience. Thank you so much. Presentation by Dr. Mary. Over to you, Dr. Bhavna. Dr. Aronoff, for a wonderful talk, brilliant presentation, giving us an overview of uveal melanoma and sharing your valuable experience with us. It's an honor to have you with us today.
बंद हो गया यार क्या पता नहीं पागल बनती है Are there any questions for Dr. Arino from the panel? Good evening, Dr. Arino. In uh, the audience. Hi. This is uh, this is Puneet Desai. The excellent presentation. Very large topic to cover in fifteen minutes. I see. Uh, <laughs> I would say, and very very well covered. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So, uh, I have one question. That uh, what's your take on uh, the small choroidal melanoma? So now there's a increasing concern let's say over a decade or so you know uh, that they met metastasize early and uh, the lesions that we were observing uh, you know uh, serially or closely observing uh, the borderline ones or the small choroidal melanomas uh, you know to look for change or serial change uh, and there has been a concern that these tend to metastasize early and should be treated so what would be your take on that yes i think um, as a community we have realized the importance of treating these smaller lesions earlier and you know that's a challenge there's always a controversy over what constitutes a large nevus versus a small melanoma but i think overall there has been an increasing trend towards treating these lesions earlier and what i'm excited about is that we are seeing this um, development of newer therapies like the AU011 which may offer an alternative to radiation and allow us to treat these tumors but to maintain vision which is always the concern when you treat something that that's small right Thank you. Uh, look forward to seeing you at the ISO meeting this year. <laughs> Same. Thank, Thank you, you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Arano. We now move on uh, to the next speaker, uh, Professor Jyotir Me Biswas. Sir is the director of Uvia and Ocular Pathology Department at Shankar Netral HNA. He did his fellowship in vitreo retinal surgery from Shankar Netral. and then a fellowship in ophthalmic pathology from the Doheny Eye Institute University of Southern California USA he is presently the director of uveitis and ophthalmic pathology departments at Shankar Netrale he is also a visiting professor at advanced eye center at PGI Chandigarh and at the Chinese University of Hong Kong He is a member of International Uveitis Study Group, the American Uveitis Society, and an executive council member of the International Ocular Inflammation Society. He received around 39 awards, including the Adenwala Oration Award and Professor Vishwanath Endowment Ekoin Telangana State Oration Award. A noted expert in uveitis, Dr. Biswas was the first person to describe ocular lesions in HIV patients in India. He has published around 445 articles in peer-reviewed index journals and authored about 54 chapters in various books in ophthalmology. He has presented over 300 papers in national and international conferences. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Biswas to this forum. good evening good evening it's a great honor for me to uh, present uh, my experience in ocular role of ocular pathology in intraocular tumors and i thank like to thank uh, dr bhavna chawla for giving me this honor and opportunity to talk on the rp center foundation day celebration i thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity i like to talk on let me share my slides intraocular tumor role of ophthalmic pathologist most common intraocular tumor specimens received in ophthalmic pathology laboratory in spite of all the advances retinoblastoma followed by malignant melanoma of the choroid which we see less number of cases but nowadays we get that vitreoretinal lymphoma various ocular specimens like vitreous biopsy fine needle aspiration biopsy choroidal biopsy and once in a while rarely we see medullary epithelioma and leiomyoma retinoblastoma role of the clinician is to provide an eyeball with 10 mm or more of the optic nerve prior communication is better for providing the best uh, um, best results from the ophthalmic pathologist 
providing proper history and clinical details, and usage of proper fixative and labeling is quite important. You use a 10% neutral buffer formalin for fixation of the enucleated globe. And this is a 10 millimeter optic now with the enucleated globe. I'll be talking first about the retinoblastoma, which is the most common intraocular tumor in the children. Retinoblastoma, what we do in the pathology lab, a series of processes like grossing, transillumination, cutting the globe, bread lobe section, paraffin embedding, sectioning, staining, and reporting. And from the eyeball, we get ultimately the glass slides, which we report for pathology. The first step is the measurement of the globe followed by the transillumination, where the intraocular tumor location is de detected. And then we go to the sectioning and grossing of the specimen. Sectioning is done so that the tumor is uh, um, involved in the sections. And we take nowadays is the bread lobe sections to find out the choroidal invasions and the tumor invasions in the, um, the other part of the globe, as well as the separate sections of the optic nerve end. The role of the pathologist is first to confirm it is retinoblastoma or not. Second is the growth pattern. Endophytic will be going towards the vitreous cavity. Exophytic will be towards the growing towards the sclera and diffuse infiltrating type grows along the retina. And then you look for differentiation. Is it well differentiated? Like with rosex, flexner, winter stainer, or homer right, or fluorex, or undifferentiated. Retinoblastoma role of pathologist is to find out the optic nerve involvement, whether it's involved or not. And if it is involved, if it goes beyond the Leon Damina Kiprosa, and surgical end of the optic nerve is involved or not. Choroidal involvement is also quite important, particularly when it's involved more than three millimeter depth. Extraskeletal extension is also noted. These are the pupil optic nerve section of the globe showing that the tumor mass is a checky white in color. What we see in histopathology is the calcification, which is deep blue in color, and necrosis, which is the pink is color, pink in color. And in case of well differentiated tumor, we see the flexner winter stenar rose, where the columnar tumor cells are located around the central lumen, and homerite rosettes, where central lumen is. Uh, replaced by the neural fibers. It's not specific for retinoblastoma, can be seen in neuroblastoma and medulloblastoma. And <clears throat> last is the florex, which is highly specific for retinoblastoma. Here there is a flower bouquet-like aggregates of tumor cells with bulbous eosinophilic processes projecting through the fenestrated membrane. Undifferentiated tumor is round or oval tumor cells with hyperchromatic nuclei and scanty cytoplasm. Several mitotic figures were seen in these uh, cells. And we look into the invasion, anti segment invasion, which is associated with the poorer prognosis. And then choroidal invasion, which can be sub-RPE or uh, full thickness choroidal invasion, more than three millimeter. Optic nerve invasion, particularly that's beyond the lamina fibrosa and surgical end of the optic nerve is associated with the poor prognosis. Recently, Grossniklas and group has differentiated retinoblastoma based on the anaplasia into the four groups, uh, retinocytoma, mild, moderate, severe anaplasia. And this is the retinocytoma, and then followed by the mild, then moderate and severe, severe anaplasia is associated with poor prognosis for life. We published um, 232 eyes with retinoblastoma histopathologic study in Journal of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. What we found that the commonest growth pattern was endophytic type. Majority of the tumors were poorly differentiated. Choroidal invasion was seen in 33% cases where the, at the time of the diagnosis as compared to the similar study from the waist as 23%. And stage four, there's a more than three millimeter choroidal invasion was the commonest. We also found the optic nerve invasion in 32% cases, which is compared to the study by Shields et al, who found 29% orbital scleral anterior chamber and iris invasion was found to be rare. No statistical significant difference was noted in terms of invasiveness between well-differentiated and undifferentiated tumors. We also found three cases 
of retinoblastoma over 20 years of age, which we reported in survey of ophthalmology. And here, one of the cases where there is a white reflex was seen in an adult when imaging with ultrasound and a CT scan showed that tumor mass over there. And subsequently, enucleation showed histopathologically retinoblastoma and confirmed by the immunohistochemistry with neuron specific enrolled staining. And then now, uh, these are the three cases which was added to the previously reported 20 cases of adult retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma in the adult, one of them was referred as retinoblastoma. All had endophytic tumors with VTS seeds. Final aspiration biopsy was done in one case for the diagnosis. All required enucleation and all was proven to an histopathologic study. Second, coming to the malignant melanoma, the choroid where there is a pigmented tumor mass is seen in the choroid, from the choroid. And where is the grossing, we look for the extra scleral extension. And the staining with both bleached and unbleached preparation is used to find out the cellular morphology. Pathology is uh, looking for the cell type, or there is a spindle cell type, or epithelioid, or there is a mixture of spindle and epithelioid that you call is a mixed type, scleral and extra scleral extension and what is vein involvement. Here is the tumor mass on section showing a clustered appearance. And this on low power microscopy showed that Brooks membrane rupture with the tumor jutting out from the choroid. Do we look at the cell type, spindle cell type or spindle cell type with a highly cohesive tumor cells. Spindle A, the nucleus is a stripe set and nucleoli is absent. Whereas the spindle B is nucleolus is seen and they are pigmented often. And in case of epithelioid cell type, we see that uh, loosely cohesive tumor cells with a prominent nucleus and nucleoli and abundant cytoplasm. Muscular syndrome is another condition where the ophthalmic pathologies play an important role. And there are several situations which can mimic uh, uh, mus uh, tumors like an uveitis condition. This is an eight-year-old girl who had persistent hypopian uveitis, not responding to the topical and systemic steroid. There's a white hypopian. Ultrasound did not show any tumor mass. And at this stage, with a suspicion of retinoblastoma, we did the anterior chamber tap. Anterior chamber tap showed basophilic cohesive tumor cells with hyperchromatic nuclei and scanty cytoplasm, suggestive of retinoblastoma. This is a seven-year-old girl, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. However, the peripheral birth smear was normal and cerebrospinal fluid was negative for malignant cells. You can see the white hypopian with convex border and on the surface of the iris, whitish infiltrate was seen. We decided to do anterior chamber tap and anterior chamber tap showed blue cells with hyperchromatic nuclei and scanty cytoplasm suggestive of lymphoblasts indicating a recurrence of leukemia, and this patient required further chemotherapy. A primary vitreoretinal lymphoma is often a diagnostic and therapeutic challenge, and here is a case of a uh, patient with a 50-year-old lady where there is a multiple tumor mass, placoid lesions were seen, and here the diagnosis is made on the clinical suspicion first and subsequently supported by multimodal imaging. But for the confirmation of the diagnosis, we require intraocular biopsy, like vitreous biopsy, fine needle aspiration biopsy, retinochoroidal or choroidal biopsy. And here the vitreous biopsy specimen should reach a pathology lab within half an hour. The cutting rate is low so that the tumor cells are not destroyed. And here you can see the vitreous biopsy specimen showing multiple atypical lymphoid cells uh, with hyperchromatic nuclei and scanty cytoplasm. Sometimes they are located within the necrotic background, which could be very challenging to find out the tumor cells requires astute observation. And cell block preparation is pre made to find out the cellular morphology in details. Here you can see the pleomorphic lymphoma cells with hyperchromatic nuclei in a necrotic background. Immunohistochemistry was done, is done with the uh, B cell marker CD20 and T cell marker CD3. Here is the CD20 positive, indicating it's a B cell lymphoma. 
This is a 57 year old lady, painless gradual dimness of vision, nine months. He was diagnosed as tubercular choroiditis, which subsequently was on histopathology. A fine needle aspiration biopsy was done on the suspicion of uh, primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. It showed in the necrotic background large lymphoma cells, confirming a diagnosis of primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. MRI after six months showed CNS lymphoma. So how to confirm the primary vitreoretinal lymphoma? The vitreous specimen with a cytospin smear is prepared and subsequently the fluid specimens from their cell block is prepared, which on cytopathology and histopathology, the diagnosis is confirmed. Immunohistochemistry is done for the clonality of the cells like uh, T cell marker and B cell marker is used. And most of the tumors are B cell tumors and interleukin level, interleukin 10 and 6 ratio is um, uh, measured. And in recently, we are doing MYD 88L265 mutations, which helps in the diagnosis of intraprimary vitreoretinal lymphoma. IL-10, IL-6 ratio, if it's more than 1.0, is suggestive of primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. And what's new is the MYD 88L265 mutations in intraocular lymphoma. We've published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology 2020, which, which showed the sensitivity of 88.9% and specificity of 91.6%. Once in a while, we see tumors like this, where a tumor mass is arising in the, in the anterior chamber from coming from the ciliary body. And this is thorough uveectomy was done and the tumor mass was removed in total. And you can see the spindle separate cells in uh, various directions uh, with a fibrillary cytoplasm, suggestive of um, suspected of a leomyoma, which was confirmed by immunohistochemistry with smooth muscle actin antibody. This was uh, published in the Salve of Ophthalmology, leomyoma of the ciliary body extending to the anterior chamber. So take home message is that ophthalmic pathologists play an important an indispensable role in diagnosis and management of various intraocular tumors. They can make the clinician to understand better by clinical pathological correlation. And it's worthwhile to visit the ophthalmic pathology laboratory to see yourself the tumor morphology and uh, histopathologic features. So William Osler, a great clinician told, as is our pathology, so is our practice, which is quite true in case of pathology of intraocular tumors. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Wonderful, uh, Dr. Biswas. And thank you for concluding before time. I'll hand it over back to Dr. Bhavna. Thank you, sir, for a beautiful summary of ophthalmic pathology. Uh, we have Dr. Seema Sain, uh, the head of ocular pathology at RP Center here amongst us. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to make some comments? Thank you very much, Dr. Biswas. It was an excellent nice presentation. And uh, we in uh, RP Center also, we are following the same techniques like you're saying for uh, retinoblastoma as well as for melanoma. And for intraocular lymphomas also, we are about to start uh, this uh, the ratio of IL-10 and IL-6 as well as the mutations. So because sometimes it's really challenging, the intraocular yes. uh, diagnosis of intraocular lymphomas can be very challenging. Yes, because the, the cells are so necrotic uh, to find out the malignant cells in the milieu of uh, necrotic tumor cells um, is often requires a very, very precise and astute observation. You have to search for that. Because so even by immunohistochemistry, sometimes both B and T cells are present. Yes. So it becomes really difficult yes. to dis uh, distinguish from reactive. Yes, regions. I agree. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Aruno is also an expert in intraocular lymphoma. Any comments on what uh, was just discussed? Yeah, I'm really excited to see the, the introduction of the MIDI-88 LP365 mutations being used more and more commonly because, you know, we do have these patients that require more than one biopsy to get a diagnosis. And I think if we agree as a community that if you get a positive MyD88 mutation, that that could be enough for diagnosis in the appropriate clinical setting, I think that would be great. 
Thank you. Any questions, Anasuya Puneet? Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Dr. Uh, I don't know. Um, so you mentioned about the proton beam um, radiotherapy for UVL melanoma. So what are the what are the cases uh, which you choose for them? Are, are the iris diffuse iris melanoma uh, that forms the major chunk, or I will like some clarity there. You mean how do we choose between plaque and proton beam? We choose, uh, so we use predominantly proton beam irradiation in Boston, and I will say that it offers some advantages in that it's more flexible. So if you have a tumor that wraps completely around the optic nerve or it involves uh, more than five clock hours, and that would be difficult to treat with the plaque that was notched, proton beam can treat that with no problem. Um, another advantage is if you have an anteriorly located tumor, like one that is in the iris or just involves a ciliary body, you can use a light field technique with proton beam irradiation so that no surgical marker clips are needed. We just use the incident light ray to aim the beam in the right place. Um, and that avoids the need to place the surgical marker clips in the operating room. Whereas, you know, otherwise you have one trip for proton beam to put on the marker rings or for plaque, it's two, one to place the plaque and one to remove the plaque. So you can avoid surgery in the patient. I think both proton beam and plaque have very high rates of local control, but that's not the problem with the disease. It's, it's the systemic risk of metastasis that we need to be better about. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. So I would like to thank our chairperson, Professor Mandeep Bajaj, for being with us here today. Our distinguished speakers, Dr. Carol Shields, Dr. Mary Arano, Dr. Jyotirmeh Biswas, who turned in live and made this uh, session really special for us. Our panelists, Professor Seema Sain, Dr. No Neviti Lomi, uh, Dr. Puni Chen, Dr. Anasuya Ganguly, who all joined in with their valuable comments. The residents, the audience, thank you all for being here. May I request Professor Bajaj to say a few words? Yeah, uh, so Dr. Bhavna, it was very well conducted and it was a very uh, nice session. I would like to say that this time the RP center has upped the ante so much that uh, you have a, such a you know, galaxy of international and national speakers. So it's a great learning opportunity for even our residents and all other people are ophthalmologists and they should not miss this. You can encourage your colleagues to join in in larger numbers because uh, you know, when uh, now, nowadays everything online resources are available and you are having so many webinars, etc. But whatever we learn from these interactions and uh, the perspective of the experts is invaluable. So I, I really feel that you should try and uh, make the best of this opportunity. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhavna. In the interest of time. <laughs> I Thank skipped you. my talk in the interest of time, maybe some other time, because the plasty session has to start, the oculoplasty session. So uh, I really thank you all for joining us and making this a very special occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. For thank you. This session. And thank you to all our speakers and chairpersons for the fantastic session. We'll be moving on to the next session and starting the next session, which is on the Occuplasty Present and Future Unleashed. I extend a very warm welcome to our chairpersons, Dr. M.S. Bajaj, Dr. Shubash Betaria, Dr. A.K. Grover, Dr. Sushil Kumar, and Dr. Neelam Pushkar. We'll be starting off with this session in a couple of minutes from now. Thank you for your patience. Hello. 
are you getting my voice hi dr subhash thank you for joining in sir i i do not uh, know you can you just tell me who are you i am not known to you yes sir i am the master of ceremony for hall b i will be coordinating this event sir what is your good name so my good name is diksha rena thank you for asking sir diksha rena ji sir what are you doing diksha i am an uh, i am an it professional sir acha you are not a doctor okay okay no, okay no, you no. are in the organizing team it absolutely, professional absolutely sir Ah, good, good. Because I know most of the doctors. I thought that you are also a doctor, and we don't know each other. Therefore, I thought, let me. I am Dr. Bethariya, ex-professor from RP Center, and maybe teachers of all of them who are on the dais, uh, including Bajaj and Grower and everybody. Wonderful, sir. Wonderful. Glad so, to meet you, sir. Uh, it is like that. Pleasure so, meeting you, sir. Uh, Hi, Dr. Santosh. Much. Good evening. Thank you for joining in. Hi, Hi, Diksha. Nice seeing you again. Yes, Hello, Santosh. How are you, Santosh? Good evening, sir. Good evening. Ah, uh, good evening, Santosh. Good to see you, Santosh. Very nice. Very nice. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Glad to see the full panel again with videos on. Good evening, Professor. Hello, hello, everyone. Good evening, Santosh. everyone. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. Ah, good evening, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Sir. Good evening, Bithariya, sir. Good evening, Grover, sir. Hi, Santosh. Ah, good evening, uh, Doctor Kasturi. nice i'll quickly check with dr bhavna do we have dr bhavna there okay so i think dr rachna will be moderating this session may I quickly check with dr rachna do we have dr rachna there i can see dr poonam on the dais yes you can I somehow don't see Dr. Rachna. Maybe we we'll wait for a minute more, and then we can get started. Okay. All right. Am I audible? Absolutely audible, ma'am. A very good evening. I welcome everyone to this first day of the scientific session that is being held on the occasion of fifty-fifth Foundation Day of RP Center. and it's so good to see so many of the teachers and alumni of rpc here and uh, uh, so we'll be beginning with the oculoplasty session just now which was to begin at 6:30 but i think uh, everyone's gone for a little break and so we are still waiting for uh, some of our chairs here but we'll start so this uh, session is uh, being chaired by, by uh, dr ms bajaj head of ocular oncology and ocular plasty rp center uh, dr subhash bitheria sir teacher uh, ex rpc head of ocular plasty and uh, president uh, opi uh, welcome sir uh, thank you yes dr ak grover um, i don't think sir needs any introduction but yet sir is president ocular plasty society of south asia and ocular trauma society of india chairman vision eye center welcome sir uh, professor neelam pushkar uh, ma'am is here an eminent oculoplastic surgeon from rp center again no need for an introduction we uh, will begin the session shortly but let me first welcome dr santosh shunawar dr mukesh dr maya pallavi nice to see you still eyes still seem little drowsy with sleep dr urmil chawla she's here be the panelist here today for the session um and have i left anyone so uh, dr anita sethi is here with us uh, physically so we'll uh, uh i'll request the chairperson to open the session maybe start with the first talk yes 
So the first uh, talk, which is uh, the plenary talk for this session today uh, is uh, by uh, Dr. Robert Goldberg. Uh, this will be a virtual talk since uh, he will not be able to join today. Um, Robert Allen Goldberg, if can we have that slide, please? Uh, Dr. Robert Allen Goldberg, born in Los Angeles, California, graduated from Stanford University in 1979 with a major in psychology. He did his residency in ophthalmology uh, from Jules Steen Eye Institute, UCLA. He holds the Bertie Levi Endowed Chair in Ophthalmology at the David Geffen School at, of Medicine at UCLA. He's an enthusiastic educator and he has been highly recognized and cited for his creative effort in oculofacial surgery. He has over 250 publications in the field, including papers from surgical technique, clinical studies, anatomic investigations, multicenter clinical trials and therapeutics. In particular, his work in Graves' disease and orbital vascular tumors has changed the management of these disorders. His anatomic studies and surgical techniques have wide influence on the practice of this particular speciality. With that, I would, uh, I cannot invite him since he's not joined us virtually. So we have a recorded talk uh, by sir. And uh, I think we can uh, play the first presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me as a guest at the RP Center Foundation meeting. Uh, I wish I could be in India personally, but it's a delight to at least be with you virtually. Today, Dr. Pallavi Singh and I are going to present uh, some thoughts on customized examination. We have our annual uh, dissection course at UCLA. Uh, this year is going to be October 7th, 8th weekend. We get a lot of international participation. And I'd be delighted to have some of my colleagues from India join us at UCLA. The information for that meeting will shortly be online. No one loves doing exoneration. Well, Pallavi says sometimes she likes when we do exoneration. So I guess the fellows like doing exonerations, but the patients hate exonerations. I hate exoneration. It's a mutilating, psychologically profound operation for the patients. And fortunately, it's increasingly rarely performed. What I wanna talk about today is that a nucleation doesn't have to be an all or none operation. We can customize it and benefit our patients by individualized decision-making. I made this little bit of a thermometer to sort of give you the concept that there's two ends of the spectrum where exoneration is not used. So at the bottom end of the spectrum, something like a slow growing anterior basal cell carcinoma that's unlikely to kill the patient. The patient's likely to die of something else. Even when that gets pretty extensive, we don't necessarily need to exonerate. Now at the other end of the thermometer are processes that are too advanced for exoneration. So an extensive squamous cell, adenoid cystic, uh, a case with MR evidence of perineural or deep spread. These are tumors for which exoneration doesn't really extend the life or improve quality of life. And so exoneration is not indicated. So really the indications are malignant orbital processes that can be surgically cured. So if there's a malignancy in the orbit and you require an exoneration to get a margin around it and the realistic goal is to cure the tumor, extend the life of the patient, exoneration is a good choice. Also inflammatory or non-malignant orbital processes where pain or other symptoms can't be controlled with anything except surgery. Sometimes we do it for palliation, just to what I call nursing care to keep the patient comfortable. 
And that's, again, a debulking of malignant process, the same thing. Even if we're not going to cure it, sometimes if it's bleeding or painful or grossly unsightly, uh, exoneration might be uh, an operation that can improve the patient's quality of life. Now, when we talk about individualizing, the principles that I'm going to try to talk about in this lecture are tailoring the surgery to the individual patient and disease process. A critical surgical point of exoneration is that we have to completely extirpate the disease with appropriate margins when needed. One of my professors said it uh, very clearly. Tan, you can remember this. They, he said, uh, you have to hate the cancer more than you love the patient. So when you are trying to cure, you've got to be sure that you get around it. Otherwise, you've done a terrible thing. You've mutilated the patient for no advantage, right? So if we're going to try for cure, we have to be sure we get around it. But at the same time, as long as we accomplish that, we want to preserve as much normal tissue as possible. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the biologic behavior of disease processes. So let's, let's, let's start when we think about individualized decision-making. The first thing that we think about is the biologic behavior of the disease process. Is it aggressive and life-threatening? What's the likelihood that the patient will die of this disease? And so there we have to take into account the patient's lifespan sometimes and think about whether they can die of something else or whether they're likely to die of this disease. And then finally, what's the biologic likelihood of cure? So has the tumor escaped the boundaries of surgery, in which case it's certainly not curable, or is it still contained within an anatomic unit where we can realistically get all the cancer cells out and cure the patient? So here's a patient with a squamous carcinoma of the anterior orbit with numbness. You can see the enlargement of the superior uh, ophthalmic or the superior orbital nerve. By the way, sometimes the radiologists miss that sign. It's important that we look for that ourselves. So this patient with numbness and, and enlarged nerve, this tumor is almost certainly back beyond the area of surgical cure. Once there's perineural spread with numbness, what we say is the cat is out of the bag. So for non-curable disease, exoneration doesn't make sense. It doesn't improve the lifespan or the quality of life. Okay, so we talked about the biologic behavior. The next consideration is the anatomic location of the disease. And we'll talk about anterior, mid orbit or posterior. Now, anterior localization of the disease, we can sometimes even do globe sparing surgery. Right, we can get a biologic margin around the tumor often just by removing the anterior orbital tissues. In the mid orbit, we consider total exoneration. So, disease in the mid orbit can sometimes be cured by complete exoneration. But the posterior orbit and the medial orbit where the sinuses are, the skull base, these are cases where surgical cure is almost always impossible because the disease is, is going to be into margins that are not treatable with exoneration. So the anatomic location is important. And by the way, when we think about the anatomic location, you can be very creative in surgical planes. So that when you're starting to think about trying to get a, a plane around the tumor, uh, you know, there's the periosteal plane, tenons plane, planes around the muscles, the lid and conjunctiva. And so it's important to have a, an anatomic flexibility and creativity in thinking about the planes. There's not just a periosteal plane and a, or not, right? There's, there's multiple planes that we can think about when we're making these anatomic decisions. Now, the last thing that we need to think about when we're individualizing the surgery are the reconstructive options. And this, I think, is one of the most critical aspects because if we're thinking about quality of life and trying to make a decision about a less invasive surgery. The whole principle of that is to try to allow the patient to reconstruction that's going to help them with the quality of life. And in particular, is an ocular prosthesis going to be a viable possibility or outcome? So when we think about the planned reconstruction of the socket, the options are a black patch which is actually not a bad option for a lot of patients. 
an oculofacial prosthesis, which means a, 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 a piece that has sometimes the eyebrow, the eyelid, the eye, plugs into the whole generation socket. Or if there's enough eyelid and enough conjunctiva to actually have an ocular prosthesis in the socket. Those are the things that we're gonna to try to decide. Jonathan Kim, when he was the fellow and Dr. Shore, my fellowship preceptor and I looked at this years ago. We looked at total exonerations and subtotal exonerations. And by the way, this is an interesting paper. I was looking back at it. The recurrence rate was about the same, but the complications of total exoneration were much more significant than the complications of, of subtotal or customized exoneration, as you'd obviously expect. But in particular, I, I was interested that 50% of the patients for whom we did a subtotal exoneration were able to wear an ocular prosthesis. So I think one of the goals of subtotal exoneration is that consideration, can the patient wear an ocular prosthesis? Here's a 60-year-old woman with squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva anterior orbit. The eye wasn't moving well, tumor in the upper uh, eyelid and part of the lower eyelid. This is an anterior location. We can possibly cure it with the anterior resection. So what we did is we removed the globe. The globe was very involved with the surgery. Most of the lateral conjunctiva, but we were able to spare some of the eyelids and some of the medial conjunctiva that were not involved with the tumor. I think I may have grafted a little bit of conjunctiva laterally. And by sparing some of the soft tissues, she was able to wear an ocular prosthesis. I guess the other way to think about this surgery probably is a supranucleation, right? And a nucleation plus, but it's, it's, in that, in, it's in that spectrum of subtotal exoneration. By the way, she had been recommended at another institution to have a full exoneration, which would have done as well at curing the disease, but she was much happier able to wear an ocular prosthesis. This is a patient with a very painful malignancy of the orbital apex. So Tani, is this curable, this one? I don't think so. It's not surgically curable because it's already back in the skull base in the cavernous sinus, right? So the goal of the exoneration is not to extend life, but he would have just severe intractable pain from this tumor. So what I did is I actually went behind the eye and just took out all the apical tumor back to the superorbital fissure. But I left the globe and the anterior tissues intact. And he, was, he, just, he ended up just keeping the eye closed. He didn't even want a prosthesis. Of course, the eye itself became sort of tysical. The orbit was very small, but he was comfortable. He avoided an exoneration procedure. He didn't have a long rehabilitation and his pain was improved. So that's an example of a subtotal posterior exoneration. This 75-year-old man he had a, a conjunctival malignant melanoma. You can see it was pretty extensive. So I did, uh, I took out the eye. I took out a lot of the conjunctiva, but I was able to spare some of the eyelids and a little bit of conjunctiva and some of the deeper orbital tissue. I did conjunctival grafting over the deeper orbital tissue. And, you know, he's missing, he has big colobome of the eyelids. But, but he was happy, at least he could wear an ocular prosthesis, right, by saving some of those soft tissues. Now, what if we have to actually do a full exoneration, if, if a case really won't allow enough sparing of the tissues to allow the patient to wear a prosthesis? Well, there are still decisions we have to make in terms of the rehabilitation. And one of the decisions is whether to do a skin graft or to allow the socket to granulate in, right? So what's the difference? Well, a skin graft allows the socket to, to be deep. So if we put a graft into the socket, then it heals as a big open cavity. And the advantage of that is that if you're gonna make a, an, a, like a, a, we talked about these orbital facial prostheses that plug in, Sometimes they can be stuck on with glue like this one. Sometimes they can use titanium uh, screws and magnets, the Brandenburg system to have it click in place. But either way, the ocularis needs a deep socket in order to make that happen. If they have a shallow socket, they won't be able to make a piece that fits in that has enough depth for them to do their you know, artistic work and to have it fit properly. And sometimes patients do pretty well with these. Um, I'd say it's 50-50. Uh, 
you know, whether you know, patients really tolerate you know, the, just the inconvenience of having to take it in and out. Some of them have to be replaced, especially the glued on ones can be messy. The, the ones on the titanium pegs are a little bit better. But still a motivated patient can be really happy with these and surprising how good they can look. You know, we put on some glasses and these patients get a lot of self-confidence in their ability to go out in public. Here's another a nice example of a facial prosthesis. On the other hand, if we allow the socket to heal by intention, uh, then you get a shallow socket because it fills with granulation tissue. And the rehabilitation in that case is mostly going to be to wear a black patch. I don't know what your experience is in India, Pallavi, but I would say I bet two thirds of my patients end up just wanting to wear a black patch. They don't really have the motivation to get the, you know, the big facial prostheses. And, and this is just a simple solution and they go on with their life. But, but that's, that's the important teaching point is that if you, you have to decide in advance if, you, if you're gonna wanna have a ocular prosthesis, you know, a, a, sorry, not ocular, but an orbit of facial prosthesis. And if you do, then you have to place a skin graft to get that deep socket. If the disease can be treated without extensive skin removal, the other option is a skin sparing exoneration. And the nice thing about this is you get very fast healing. And of course you get a shallow socket because you're, you know, the skin's gonna grow out across. So here's an example of the skin sparing exoneration that we did recently. By the way, a, a useful trick if you don't know about it, when you're doing an exoneration, one of the first things that I do is empty the eye. We let the uh, junior resident do that and tell them they can add it to their list as a vitrectomy. And so they do a little bit of a vitrectomy with an 18 gauge needle, take out the food in the eye. What that does is it makes the socket soft all of a sudden. So it's much easier to do the work. So we deflated the eye. And then uh, I, I honestly can't remember what disease this was, but I was able to spare the skin, the skin of the eye that was uninvolved. It must have been some ocular surface, a very bad conjunctival tumor going into the globe. We then do the regular exoneration. And by the way, because this was mostly a tumor of the anterior orbit and globe, I was able to spare some of the deeper orbital tissues. So I've got some deep tissue in the orbit that we've spared, and we've spared some skin. So then we can just close the skin, maybe with a little bit of undermining. And this patient, you know, is back into activities in you know, three to five days, right? As soon as the swelling and the pain is gone. So this is a nice way to get a patient quickly rehabilitated to create a shallow socket. But I'll tell you one important thing, which is that this works best if you leave some tissue in the orbit. But if you've got a very deep exoneration and then you try to save the lids, in my experience, sometimes it works, but often the lids don't survive because you have this sort of thin lid skin sitting like a trampoline in the air and it, there's just not enough blood supply or support. So I've had some cases where the skin didn't make it. So this, this subtotal skin sparing examination works best if you do have enough orbital tissue left to sort of support that skin flap. But sometimes, sometimes I've seen that tent skin flap survive. So to summarize, what we've talked about is that exoneration is not an all or none operation. I think that advice is probably true for virtually everything we do. But you can be creative and thoughtful in every patient in trying to, in trying to design a customized surgery that, that accomplishes the things that we want to, considering the bio, biology, anatomy, and the rehabilitation options we try to customize an operation that optimally treats the disease, whether that treatment is a goal of cure or palliation, but at the same time, spares as much tissue as possible and prepares us for the rehabilitation options, which as you can see, really have to sort of be thought about ahead of time. As we're driving the car, our destination is what's gonna be the rehabilitation and that allows us to decide how we're gonna make the decisions in these steps. When aggressive surgery is indicated for cure, leave no prisoners, right? 
if you're going to mutilate the patient, you better be darn sure that you've done everything possible to get around the disease. But when the chance for cure is remote, then we try to find the least invasive option possible that'll uh, optimally help the patient with their quality of life. I hope that's a helpful overview of an interesting, difficult topic. Again, I feel badly that I'm not there in person, but uh, it, it, as soon as things open up, I'll look forward to going back to India, visiting Pallavi and all my friends there. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful synopsis of this rarely talked surgery, exentration. It's a highly disfiguring surgery and most of us don't want to do an exentration in a patient. And uh, I'm sure this will uh, help us with the decision making. But we, uh, before I go on to the next speaker, I thought we could ask uh, 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 all uh, those who have joined us here today about uh, exentration, how's their experience? So uh, could I, uh, uh, Dr. Santosh Navar is there, sir? Yeah, hi. Yes, sir. Uh, so what do you do? Do you go ahead and do a, a subtotal or a total exentration? I mean, uh, are you uh, favoring... Uh, a subtotal exentration in cases where it is possible or uh, would you go ahead with a total exentration? And do you do a primary skin grafting where you do a total exentration? I mean. Well, yeah, so I pretty much do a customized exentration. Whenever there is necessity, then only you go for total radical and extended exentration. Otherwise, if anterior exentration is all that the patient needs, that's what he gets. Of course, we try to spare as much of skin as possible. And it is never difficult, in my experience at least, it's never difficult to get a primary closure by mobilizing subgrowth tissues and the cheek tissues together. Sometimes it leads to a shallow socket, but the patient can have a spectacle-mounted prosthesis for sure, if not a glue-on prosthesis. Uh, second issue is following exentration. If at all the margins are positive, then you are bound to give external beam radiation if the tumor is radiosensitive, not to forget the role of adjuvant chemotherapy. So unless oculoplasty surgeons remember the basic principles of oncology, then you're bound to have either local tumor recurrence, intracranial extension, or systemic metastasis. Right, right. Thank you so much, sir. I think that is all uh, what we tell our residents that when you are excising a tumor, you don't think about reconstructing. You just go ahead and excise the tumor uh, not thinking about reconstruction at that point of time. So thank you so much. We'll now go on to our uh, next speaker, Dr. A.K. Grover, sir. Uh, is he, uh, I think, sir, joined online. Yes, sir. Welcome, sir. Sir would be talking about uh, state of the art in management of orbital fra fractures. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Regina. It's a huge privilege. Nick part of the uh, centen or the uh, RPC Day Foundation celebrations in the centenary year of the founder, Professor L.P. Agarwal, our teacher. And of course, no greater privilege than being at your alma mater. I'll start my slide share. I hope you can see my slides and hear me well. Yes, Rachna? Yes, yes, okay. So I'll be talking about the current state of management of orbital fractures and will emphasize on the aspect of patient-specific implants. The goal of orbital fractures surgery is restoration of the orbital anatomy. And volume in particular is the key to management of orbital fractures and acute and actual assessment of the volume ha has played an important role in our better understanding and management. So what I'll be discussing will be an accurate assessment of the altered anatomy is critical 
Assessment of orbital volume changes due to orbital fractures is important. 3D imaging and modeling has become an important part. And then you are able to choose a precise correction modality. Appropriate or patient-specific implants are then used to restore anatomy. And you can then assess how well you have corrected to give you lessons for the future. So CT scans, both the coronals and the, the sagittal play an important part in our assessment and a complete assessment is critical to further planning. It is important to be able to transport images to the person who would do the 3D, uh, 3D imaging and uh, modeling. So it is important to have DICOM standard for your imaging. And then a good assisted 3D assisted quantitative assessment of orbital volume is important by 3D volume surface rendering assisted region of interest computation. So the landmarks um, are easily identifiable and uh, the, these are relatively standard and there are standard softwares available for computation. Takes a little while to mark those landmarks and the studies show that you get reproducible figures and it is quite safe to utilize normal orbit as a control for management of the disease side. And you're able to restore back the volume as compared to the opposite side. This is the 3D imaging that we are able to get from the manufacturer. Once we send the DICOM images, we get the models and the size of the implant that uh, is proposed, we can modify it and suggest what needs to be done. Now, what are the situations where we want to use the patient specific implants? Of course, there are these situations like the white eyed fracture, small hairline fractures, where a simple removal of incarceration, ensuring a free force duction test followed by placement of a simple absorbable or a simple thin implant is all that you need. But those with large herniation of contents may require more extensive dissection, removal of the incarceration, as you see here, until you're able to see all the edges. Once you're able to see all these edges of the uh, um, fracture, you can simply place um, EPTFE or a, a MedPOR implant, which covers that defect adequately. However, defects such as those with medial wall fractures and uh, floor fractures as well, or with significant downward displacement, the reaching the posterior ledge is important and the three uh, titanium implants, either flat or preformed, are useful in taking care of these cases. Cases like these with medial wall and floor fractures do quite well if you cover the ledge well and make sure that you cover the medial wall well with the right contour. So you're able to get excellent restoration. However, if there are multiple walls involved or near to total loss of orbital floor in segments, then a customized patient specific implant is important as was this patient which, uh, who presented to us four months after injury with a huge floor fracture and medial wall fracture, as you can see. We could get the 3D modeling and the patient specific peak implant for him, which could be implanted after an extensive dissection. You need much more extensive periosteal incision and much more extensive dissection in order to be able to place these implants. And then you have to fixate them. Sometimes you have to trim them and place them in position so that you're able to restore the um, volume much better and get a much better uh, sulcus deformity and enophthalmos. So the images can be seen post-operatively here, where you can see the restoration of the floor lateral wall, even though we, since it was an old fracture, we've not done anything about this. Here, we also had to fixate the lateral canthus after this with um, a new uh, place, placement of uh, implant and uh, screws. So this is the restoration of the floor that you can see. This is shaped well. So even if you are not reaching the posterior ledge, it will give you a good positioning because it's a very firm implant. So this is an example of a patient-specific titanium implant with modeling 
where we could restore the volume well and give a good correction. To summarize, advantages of 3D printing and patient-specific implants is the ability to mirror the fellow orbit, plan well, complete walling of defects is possible, precise match of contour can be done, and more precise volume restoration can be carried out. Now, the peak implants have an advantage of high biocompatibility, good imaging properties, good mechanical properties, and convenient manufacturing processes to get the right shapes. However, there are limitations. You need this advanced technology, cost is more, you need a cl close coordination of surgeon radiologist and technical team. There is a learning curve, which we'll talk about in a more detailed talk, and limitation of soft tissues to accommodate implant planned on skeleton model, and therefore you need intraoperative trimming, drilling, shaping, etc. To, to conclude, 3D modeling and volume assessment and use of patient-specific implants are the future of orbital fracture management in appropriate cases. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. That was indeed an exciting talk. And we know how challenging it is to repair these fractures, especially when multiple walls are involved. I will now invite our uh, next speaker, Dr. Kasturi Bhattachari. Uh, ma'am is here with us. Welcome, ma'am. And her talk is on technological updates in oculoplasty. Over to ma'am, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rachna, Dr. Neelam, Bajaj, sir. It's so nice to meet all, meet all of you. Can you see my slides? Am I audible? Yes. Yes, Kasturi. So mm -hmm. I'm speaking on the technological updates in orbit and nucleoplasty surgery, especially my experiences. Let me minimize this. Okay. So let me start by mentioning that humans always have an inquisitiveness towards exploring the unseen. And because of this, there has been so much updates in technology in oculoplasty in terms of navigation, in terms of 3D printing, which Grover sir has already mentioned, the PSI, the robotic surgery, the AI, the AR, and the VR. So what is this navigation? It is something like a GPS, which gives you a roadmap where the data that we have, the data are being preloaded into computer, which gives us a real time updates. And this data in, are in the form of the CT, the MRI and MRA, and the real time updates, which gives us an endpoint of the surgery. So this survey equips us with tools for differential color coding, precise marking, and mapping of the site of the pathology, where you can incorporate the MRI, MRA, and also the most useful, especially when you have a unilateral trauma, because you can go for segmentation, you can go for mirroring, and you can load the images twice, you merge the mirrored over the normal one, and then you identify defect, quantify the displacement, and have the patient-specific implants. And here I use extensively for preoperative planning in the pipeline for those, yeah, I mean, complex surgery, I mean, fractures, where you can see the horizontal buttress, buttresses are being, I mean, fractured, the vertical buttresses are being involved, as you can see here, with multiple fractures involving the wall, involving the rim, and especially the complex NOE fracture, where you have big fractures involving the nose, the orbit, and the inferior wall. So what uh, Dr. Grover sir, has already mentioned is 3D printing, but this is something like same, what we do, we mirror the normal orbit over the abnormal and we measure how much amount of expansion with the navigation system. And once the registration is being done, then we go ahead with the surgery. And the advantage is that, you know, like this is my stylet you can see now, this is before the surgery where the stylet you can see it has gone deep inside the maxilla. And now once the horizontal buttress is being managed and then you manage the uh, orbital walls, as you can see here, this is an MTM implant, that is a metpore titanium metpore implant. And then you manage the fracture, you can see a very good adequate correction. And the end point of the surgery is what I just want to show you here, the end point of the surgery, you can see I am placing my striker here. Now it does not go into the maxilla, that means it shows that I have reached the end point of the surgery. 
And you get the adequately very good correction, especially this patient with so much of dystopia, but canthal dystopia, or orbital dystopia, and a good correction of the surgery. In very complex surgery also, if you can mirror the normal over the abnormal, and you can measure the exact volume reconstruction you, that you need to give. And the beautiful thing is that once you correct this horizontal buttresses, and you can see this rectangular type of the orbit being changed in the, the globe, I mean, the oval type, which we want, with a very good correction of the inoptimus. Another indication which I use extensively is for the orbital apex surgery, especially in the situation where you have the optic canal with the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery. And we all know this optic canal is so much inside the orbit, approximately 46 millimeter. And any trauma to this canal can lead to traumatic optic neuropathy, which can be uh, indirect or direct, direct being due to the impingement or the fracture or due to the uh, hematoma, etc. So I'm just showing one example. See, this is when I was doing an optic canal surgery for traumatic optic neuropathy. So when I was putting my stylet, every time you can see the stylet is going deep into the sphenoid sinus. So I've realized that something is wrong in the surgery. I have not gone into the proper plane. So this really guides you during the surgery, whether you're in a correct plane or not. So I have further gone down. I have gone for the decompression. And as I was going further down for my decompression and remove the fracture segment, now you can see the stylet can, is moving from the orbital to the cranial end of the optic canal, which shows that I have decompressed the canal in both the, you can see in the actual coronal, and this is the sagittal reaching the end point of the surgery. This is what, how we do uh, optic canal, I mean, uh, I mean, traumatic optic neuropathy, where you can see that as I was proceeding with the surgery, this is anti arrhythmoidal blood vessel, and once you, you I'm, I mean, before the start of the surgery, you can mark where is the anti arrhythmoidal blood vessel, where is the posterior arrhythmoidal blood vessel. And as you go ahead with the surgery, now you can see this is a posterior arrhythmoidal blood vessel, and here I'm putting the navigation stylet, and it shows that I have not yet reached the canal. I'm just somewhere within the posterior arrhythmoid. So I need to go further down, and as I was going further down, I reached the optic canal, and this way you can see the beautiful optic canal with the annulus of the same. So it had helped me reach the end point of the surgery and this is a very safe special in such situation in the orbital apex it cannot go inferior laterally because there's a chance of the optical keratitis and the chance of injuring the carotid artery so you need an eviction system when you work in the apex and the third important indication is the localization when you have something like this a foreign body in the frontal bone. And if you can draw the route of entry, it really helps you to navigate, navigate so well, and you can reach the end point of the surgery and with very minimal manipulation, you can manage such situation. Another beauty of this instrument that you can preoperatively plan, like this is a patient, the croissants, when it came to us, it really helped me planning and helped me do something more innovative. Like I have measured the soft tissue amount, I have measured the bony contents, and this has really helped us to know how much amount of manipulation of the bone or the soft tissue that I need to do. And this is what it helped me do something innovative where I had done the orbital malar advancement because we know they have a very shallow socket. So I need to have an interior displacement of this socket. And along with some of the decompression of the superior orbital dream, as you can see here, this is in the front view, this is in the lateral view, the same thing that has been done. And then this is a surgery, I'm going very fast because I'm of the lack of time. And this is what I want to show you, like this is a whole of the orbit and the maxilla, and then this helps you plan the surgery, how much of rotation you can do so that you can give an adequate amount of socket. And once you separate this and you rotate and you fix it, and then you decompress the wall, these are the results that you get. This is the child approximately 21 days after the procedure. And this is now when she looks back, you can see there's no much luxation bulb and this is now after five years, and this is the socket. You can see a good expansion. The vertical diameter has increased from 19 to almost 31 millimeter. And this is the child you can see here. Sorry. And this is how she looks now after five years of the surgery. So it, this navigation really helps in your multiple aspects, and it has it is used for multiple indications for orbit and oculoplasty surgery. And for the 3D, Grover has already mentioned very well, and not go much into details. Like many of us are going for 3D printing, which helps us to, I mean, plan the surgery and give it a very good correction in not only the fracture, but the most important indication when you have the bad anophthalmic socket or very poor inophthalmic socket. 
And like, this is what we do when we have the bad soccer with too much of fibrosis. We need to measure, we need to see how much of the inoptimus and helps you plan the surgery, how much amount of volume you can give or the same procedure, which I have shown you for my uh, cruisons, like, like it helps you correct this inoptimus socket. As you can see here, what I have done, I have done the same thing, orbitomalar advancement I have done with the anterior rotation keeping the bony wall intact and at the same time, there has been so much discussion today about exenteration, but in such situation, when you don't have a tumor, it is always advisable to fill the exenterated cavity or the deep socket with the temporary muscle, which I usually very routinely do when I know that when it is not a malignant condition. And these are the results that you can see here. This is just after the procedure and this is a year after the surgery. And this is how the patient looks before and after the surgery. So these are some of the advances and, and there are lots of advances. Like I have just started the research, planning to start the research. I'm talking with the IT personnel or, or, of the use of artificial intelligence and robotic surgery has also been come into ophthalmology where people are using robotic surgery. And the most interesting that has come to ophthalmology is the augmented reality. The advantage of the augmented reality is that you can actually see, you can have the 3D images, you can have the real images in the surgical field, which really give, makes it a very safe surgery for you. Thank you very much for the patient hearing. Thank you, ma'am. Again, very exciting. I think uh, this is the first time that I've actually seen an ophthalmologist showing an orbitomalar uh, uh, advancement. So that was, I think, something absolutely new for us. And uh, also, I uh, Dr. Kasuri is the first ophthalmologist to start navigation-guided transorbital optic canal decompression surgery in India. So uh, just love those videos. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's always a pleasure listening to you. And with that, I invite our uh, next speaker, Dr. Santosh Hunava. So everyone knows editor, IJO, and heads uh, the uh, Center for Site Hyderabad uh, uh, facility. Um, he's well known for his uh, contribution to ocular oncology. And today, but he will be talking about oculoplasty. And uh, the title of his talk is Role of Medical Management in TED. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to talk to any gathering at API Center, my alma mater. I'll be talking about medical management of thyroid eye disease. Thyroid eye disease is like a house on fire. There are two ways you can quantify thyroid eye disease. One is by activity and the other by severity. Activity, there is of course an objective scale. We use UBOGO classification where you score the patient out of seven at the first visit or out of 10 in subsequent visits, follow-up visits. Whereas for severity, there are criteria, again, you go, go. Mild, there is hardly any controversy, minor related retraction, minor soft tissue involvement, exophthalmus of less than three millimeter, transient or no diplopia, whereas moderate to severe disease is one where there is exophthalmus of more than three millimeter, inconstant or constant diplopia in functional positions of gaze and moderate or severe soft tissue involvement. Also eyelid retraction of more than two millimeter. Now, very severe or sight threatening thyroid eye disease is when there is imminent threat to vision, this thyroid optic neuropathy and corneal breakdown or exposure. In patients who have inactive disease for more than six months, irrespective of their severity, there are generally cases for surgical treatment, stage surgical treatment, starting with orbital decompression, extraocular muscle surgery, and finally eyelid surgery. Whereas patients who have active disease, whatever may be the severity, are candidates for medical management. Now, there are a host of medical management uh, modalities that are available, general measures, stopping smoking, selenium, all that is uh, possible. But the most important measure is use of steroids. Oral steroids, intravenous steroids, intraorbital steroids, and immunomodulation and immunobiological. So these are the modalities that we have. If you look at the literature, if somebody were to use oral steroids in an active disease, there is a 30% chance that the patient will remain in remission and 70% of them reactivate. Whereas if you use intravenous steroids, then 70% of patients remain in remission over a period of time, 30% still reactivate. Whereas if you add intravenous steroids and immunomodulators, 
there's a chance that a majority of patients will remain in remission, whereas minority will still reactivate. Immunobiologicals have come in a big way, and if they become available in India, probably will change the management and the talk of what I'm giving today will not be of much relevance. So what we currently use for active disease is not the high dose or uh, intravenous steroids, but low, -zo, low dose intravenous pulse methylprednisolone. What I mean is that in the first pulse or induction pulse, we use 500 milligram for three consecutive days, that is 1.5 gram. For every subsequent pulse, every three weekly, we use one single injection of 500 milligram alone. At the end of pulse three, when the patient comes for pulse four, we uh, re-evaluate the patient, of course, at every visit, but pulse four is the decision-making time when if the patient has partially responded or suboptimally responded, readily you add immunomodulators, favored are mycophenolate morphotel or azathioprine. Why do you do it at this time? Because immunomodulation is something that takes time to work, six weeks to eight weeks or even nine weeks. We want steroids to very gently handshake with the immunomodulators not abruptly stop steroids and start immunomodulators when you stop steroids. That will be too late for you to have not to have peaks of inflammation in between steroids and immunomodulation. So uh, these are the steroid pairing agents. We prefer mycophenolate or oral as they have been. Now, how do these work? We look at three important aspects, ex exophthalmos, extraocular motility restriction, and disease activity. You can look at the change in the exophthalmus that the patient has following just intravenous methylprednisolone alone. This works in patients who have uh, active disease and also suboptimally in patients who have inactive disease. This is again a patient with pre-treatment exophthalmus. This is following intravenous methylprednisolone and oral azathioprine. Patient obviously did not need surgery. This is one more patient with bilateral active disease you can see nice reduction in exophthalmus with oral, intra, oral immunomodulation after six months. What percentage of patients have relief with exophthalmus? You can see that about 60% of patients show relief with exophthalmus and the mean improvement in exophthalmus was 2.7 millimeters. Now, what about ocular motility and diplopia? This is the pre-treatment appearance of the patient. You can see that the ocular motility is restricted and post-treatment, the patient's lid retraction has reduced, exophthalmus has reduced, and ocular motility is improved. One more example of a patient where the patient had manifest hypertropia initially, and after treatment, her squint seems to have settled down. This patient had ocular motility restriction and consequent vertical diplopia. That, will, that has settled down and the patient does not have diplopia anymore. You can see the reduction in thickness of the inferior rectus following immunomodulation. So immunomodulation helps in a big way. One more patient where there is ocular motility restriction, as you see here, normalized following IVMP and mycophenolate morphetal. About 60% of patients are rid of diplopia following treatment. What about remission from disease activity? A majority of patients have remission from disease activity. That is the beauty of this treatment. This is pre-treatment. Of course, this is post-treatment. Patient has other improvements as well in terms of lid retraction, exophthalmus, but also has remission from disease activity. And that happens in nearly 90% of patients. And that is very important. Clinical activity score, you can see that uh, pre-treatment, it was 7.1 mean and post-treatment, it reduced to 1.2. That is a significant activity. And this table shows that intravenous methylprednisolone and oral immunomodulation together have uh, benefited a majority of patients. In severe or site threatening, you use a totally different protocol where we give high dose intravenous methylprednisolone. And this is one example of a patient where there is complete remission following high dose intravenous methylprednisolone. About 50% of patients behave this way. This is one more patient where this treatment has worked, where his dysthyroid optic neuropathy has got stabilized and the patient did not need immediate medial orbital decompression. Newer firefighting modalities are in terms of biologicals. We have Rituximab, but what is important is Teplotumumab, which is the new uh, entrant into the field. Rituximab was always used. These are the drugs that have been tried. We have used Rituximab in patients who are refractory to intravenous methylprednisolone and immunomodulation. But what is uh, introduced currently is FDA-approved Teplotumumab, which is currently not available in India. This is a patient who has failed IVMP and azathioprine following Rituximab. She shows improvement. 
This is a young individual who had refractory thyroid eye disease with a lot of inflammation following IVMP and immunomodulation, settled down beautifully with rituximab. So rituximab works well, but teprotumumab, the idea is that it has shown remission not only in activity of the disease, but also in proptosis reduction. This has showed remarkable effect in proptosis reduction, improvement in extraocular motility, and the need for surgery may actually reduce. For eyelid retraction, we used to do LPS recession, looking at the number of studies. Obviously, this has not worked so well or not been standardized. Patients are not happy because of the flattening of the lid effect. In such patients, we use intra-LPS steroids. This is a medical management where at some stage in the disease, active or inactive, you can start intra-LPS translinone, intra-LPS 5FU also works. These are examples of patients who have done well with intra-LPS translinone. About 60% of patients work well with intra-LPS triamcillone. Their severe retraction reverses without any need for surgical intervention. So this uh, flowchart actually summarizes what I said. I won't go into it, but this one slide emphasizes the role for medical management. If you look at all the literature and put all the numbers together, if the patient were to undergo inact surgery when the disease is active without primary medical management, then the chance of reactivation is as high as 40%. About a one quarter of them, of them actually reactivate. That becomes a difficult situation. If the patient is inactive at surgery without primary medical management, about 4 to 22% reactivate, which is reasonable. But if the patient were to have primary medical treatment and then undergo surgery, the chance of reactivation is substantially less. So that is a point that I'm trying to make is that by customized medical management, you're going to reduce the chance of reactivation and increase the durability of whatever surgical procedure that you have performed, either decompression or extraocular motility uh, surgery, squint surgery or eyelid surgery, the durability of the surgery would be much better. So uh, in conclusion, I would say that medical management is indicated as primary management in moderate to severe active thyroid disease and also in site-threatening thyroid disease. It has reasonable success, and biologicals are, of course, knocking on the door. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So just one question. So uh, where you're giving the pulse uh, treatment uh, with the steroids, with the third cycle itself, you start uh, the, the immunomodulation for all cases with severe uh, disease, severe yeah. activity? Depends on the response, you tailor it. In patients who haven't responded, whose uh, scores still remain in the range of four to five or six, you know, that is where when you start, if the patient has responded well, then you don't need to start immunomodulation. I would say about 50% of patients actually need immunomodulation and 50% don't, don't, irrespective whether they were moderate to severe or severe. So you re reassess after the third cycle. And, uh... third cycle and at the end of, third cycle that is the beginning of the fourth cycle is the decision making time when you really want to start immunomodulation at that stage or not yes and the other thing that i noted was that in the first pulse you've given three consecutive days of steroids That's is right. that correct That's right. all right okay thank you so much sir thank you any other questions all right now we go on thank you so much sir we're going to our next speaker now uh, the next talk is by uh, Dr. Milan Nayak. Uh, sir is working at LV Prasad Eye Institute since 2001. He has 18 years of experience in eye, eye plastic surgeries, and uh, his area of expertise includes thyroid eye disease, cosmetic eyelid, and facial surgery. Welcome, sir. Uh, the talk uh, that sir would be giving is minimally invasive ophthalmic plastic surgery. Over to you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Am I audible? And is my slides visible? Yes, yes, Milan, you're audible. We all can hear you. <clears throat> Great. So it, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to be a part of the RPC of Thalmic Carnival. And uh, if I were to, on this occasion, look back at the... Uh, RPC, so to speak, in my life. It starts with Professor Ravi Thomas, uh, who gave me an opportunity to study ophthalmology at Velour. Uh, Dr. Rao uh, 
who gave me an opportunity to join the Plasky Fellowship with Dr. G.C. and Dr. Santosh training me and several other people including Dr. Betheria, Dr. Grover, Dr. Pushkar, Dr. Bajaj and several other uh, RPC alumni who have uh, taught Plasty to me over the years. So I never uh, actually have attended this program but I have always been uh, a part of so to speak the RPC culture and I So I'll be quickly touching upon minimally invasive ophthalmic plastic surgery and what it really stands uh, for me and what I would uh, like to touch upon. So as an ophthalmologist, we are uh, tuned to... And the same thing when you bring in oculoplastic surgery, you have several advantages over all the other specialists with whom part of your job may overlap. And that is exactly uh, what I'm going to talk about. And in the interest of time, I would touch upon four concepts which uh, mean minimally invasive to me. And I'll start with dermoids. Uh, when we look at patients with dermoids, we always tend to choose an eyelid piece for the uh, excision so that the scar remains hidden because no one really wants a scar which is visible. But this is not always possible and sometimes the dermoid is so fixed to the bone that you may have to choose an external or slightly visible incision. So what do you do in that case? So how were we able to remove a large dermoid like that through a small stab incision? And that according to me is uh, being minimally invasive where we took a small stab incision, exposed the cyst wall, we punctured it we aspirated all the contents and then we removed that collapsed bag through the smaller incision. So the goal is to get the dermoid wall out, not necessarily intact, in the interest of having a smaller incision. Similarly, if we have dermoids in locations where uh, an, a visible incision is apparently obvious, you could try and hide those incisions in the hairline, as you can see here and excise it or we could even do what is called as an endoscopic dermoid removal for frontotemporal dermoids. Here is an example of a patient who underwent one such surgery where the scars were entirely hidden in, in the skull. So although the dissection is lengthy, here it is minimally invasive and it is elegant because you were able to hide the scar. Similarly, uh, there are cases which present late in life and that's not uncommon in India. And here if you were to entirely remove the lesion surgically, not only would there be a dent on the bone because of the fossa formation, but you would also have a visible scar. So instead, one could try and do what is called as foam sclerotherapy, which works beautifully, albeit some cases need multiple sessions of the same. Talking about abscess, uh, we all uh, as a resident were trained to drain an abscess with a cruciate incision and spread an artery forceps to break all loculi. But unfortunately, orbit is not a place where we can afford that, where every surrounding structure is very important. So in these cases, we have been uh, increasingly performing abscess aspirations rather than uh, incision and drainage, be it lacrimal or orbital. This is an easy access, it is quick, uh, it uh, reduces the bacterial load and it also gives you a clean sample for microbiological assessment. So this according to me is one more area where you could be minimally invasive. The third area is a lateral orbitotomy where bone removal can possibly be avoided. Here is an example of a patient who has an intraconal mass looks large enough and one might think of performing a lateral orbitotomy but what you could do is just a transconjunctival approach access this intraconal space between the inferior and the lateral rectus muscle and that will allow you to deliver this lesion without having to place any bony marginotomy so to speak one can always 
plan this as a part of the procedure and if you find that the lesion is large enough or not compressible enough the lateral uh, canthal extension of your incision can always allow you to go to a classic marginotomy but increasingly we find that less and less required. Finally, uh, the last point about staged versus simultaneous procedures and uh, the best example is thyroid eye disease where the classic paradigm which has been taught to us over the years is first manage decompression, then talk about strabismus, then eyelid and finally aesthetics. Lately, there are papers which talk about simultaneous orbital decompression and eyelid surgery. Here is another paper that talks about aesthetic eyelid surgery along with decompression as a one stage approach. The same we tried uh, with ptosis which apparently is uh, not so uncommon and associated with thyroid eye disease. So this patient with left proptosis and aponeurotic ptosis we fixed both in the same city. Here is an example, uh, here, here are the pre and post photographs of this indication. On similar fibromatosis can also be treated for the NF with a modified or a differential template technique. At the same time, you can reattach the levator such that in one stage you get maximum correction. Here is another example of this. So just to summarize, uh, I touched upon four common areas in plasty where uh, minimally invasive thought process could help us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Milan. Sir, can you tell us if you have any experience with use of bleomycin also in uh, with after aspiration in dermoids? Bleomycin, no. Uh, we've just used ethanolamine oleate and even STS, but no bleomycin. All right. And uh, uh, I think, uh, ma'am, uh, anything about uh, external angular dermoid uh, transconjunctival or minimally invasive surgery, I think ma'am's been doing for some time now. <laughs> okay, okay, not to mention that then. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, now we go on to our next speaker, uh, uh, Professor Neeram Pushkar. Ma'am needs no introduction. She's been a teacher to many oculoplasty surgeons around India. And I welcome Ma'am for her talk, which is Paradigm Shift in Reconstruction of Large Eyelid Coloboma. Thank you, Dr. Rashna. So after uh, so many wonderful talks on challenging areas in oculoplasty, I think uh, now uh, another challenging area we have is the large eyelid coloboma. So the shift which, which I'm talking about here is basically to shift our focus from the two stage surgeries to single stage surgeries. So we all know eyelid coloboma is a full thickness defect in the eyelid involving its margin. The commonest reason is after excision of malignant tumor, we get the iatrogenic defect. Choice of surgical procedure depends on the size. I'll um, focus on the large eyelid colobomas. And we know that in large eyelid coloboma, we have to reconstruct both the lamellae. And it depends on the tissues available with us, with surgeons' uh, preference and expertise also. Most of us generally treat these patients by lip sharing procedures, which are, uh, which are as such simple procedure for oculoplasty surgeons. But we should remember that these procedures are mostly two stage procedure. These are some pictures. As you can see, Hughes procedure with a um, skin graft, two stage procedure. This is another patient with skin uh, advancement. And below you can see after the second stage surgery, which is usually done after four to six weeks. This is cutler beard lid uh, sharing procedure with a globular flap. Again, beautiful results, but uh, two-stage surgery. So why I'm saying uh, that we need to shift our focus from two-stage procedures now to single-stage procedures, because uh, single-stage procedure will avoid second surgery. It will help in early recovery. And now we have ample supportive liter literature on the single-stage surgeries. So uh, just to talk about some of the interesting, you know, uh, concepts and surgery, which I have come across in uh, past few years. One is the island skin flap. 
So this, uh, I'll go straight to the picture. So uh, this, as you can see, that the uh, skin is free from all around, but it is attached with the underlying orbicularis. So it is basically, uh, of, it's behaving like a flap and you can rotate it 90 degrees and then you can reconstruct the posterior lamella with whatever material of your choice. And uh, generally I use uh, lip mucosa or sometimes even cartilage uh, graft for posterior lamella reconstruction. So this is a single stage procedure. One can always work uh, 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 on this procedure and the, there is sufficient literature on this now. The other concept I want to highlight today is the composite craft uh, with the sandwich technique. So what exactly is the sandwich technique? We all know composite graft is basically, uh, it helps in reconstruction of both anterior and posterior lamellae. It is a single stage surgery. Uh, if there is a moderate defect, you can take uh, the full thickness eyelid from the uh, normal eyelid. And, but if it is a large uh, you know, coloboma, then you need more tissue. So it's better to take from the uh, ear. So what we do is that we take the skin and the underlying cartilage with its perichondrium end block. And as shown in the picture here in the diagram, Generally, I prefer suturing this away from the lead margin or say from the colobometer's edge. So we have to be very selective in choosing this uh, procedure. And uh, the um, uh, concept of sandwich technique is basically that whatever recipient orbicularis is there, we sandwich that in between the skin, which is debulked to some extent, so, uh, between the skin and between the, uh, the other side, it, there is a cartilage. So we sandwich that recipient orbicularis in, so that there is proper nutrition to the uh, free graft because it is basically two uh, graft which you are taking. So uh, nutrition also should be there. So this again is a single stage procedure and it works very well. This is a series of patients uh, in print now and uh, you can see on the uh, left hand side this patient has a deep upper lid coloboma post-traumatic and below you can see after artificial eye the full thickness lid has been reconstructed using the auricular skin cartilage graft the other child is of hemifacial uh, microsomia with the lower lid which is retracted because it is deficient so the full thickness uh, lid um, tissue was provided by the auricular skin cartilage graft and you can see that almost seven, eight millimeter of lid retraction has been corrected. Uh, the problem with the um, skin cartilage graft is that the cartilage is limited. We take out from the scapha of the ear and it is limited. So in the, this patient is due for a second surgery for this notch and hopefully we'll be able to align the eyelid. Uh, this is a, a very traditional time-tested techniques. We all know glazier's flap, as you can see in the diagram. So, and the other one is the mustardized cheek rotation flap. Uh, again, it has some uh, selective uh, indications only. This uh, technique is a novel technique which was uh, published by me. And in this, the coloboma was repaired by full thickness eyelid tissue, which had its lid margin as well as cilia. So this was published and uh, this is the uh, sketch diagram. You can say, see here in yellow is the coloboma of the upper eyelid. So uh, I'll be showing a video also of this. So in this from the normal lid, the uh, ipsilateral opposing lid, full thickness eyelid is taken and this whole uh, semicircular line which you are seeing, it is cut full thickness along the orbital rim, rest of it is attached. And then it is rotated in the upper lid and rest of the, uh, the lower lid, it is uh, advanced and we form the lower lid also. This is intra picture uh, of a patient you can see there is an upper lid coloboma after frozen it's almost like you know 60-70% of the lid coloboma. You can see that the upper lid has around 5-6 to six mm of lateral canthus which is very important that the colobomatous lid should also have some lateral can canthus um, uh, and you can see in the, lo the lower lid also I have taken around 6 millimeter and the whole lateral eyelid is rotated and it is sutured. So this is a video of two minutes. A patient with upper lid uh, sebaceous uh, cell carcinoma after frozen guided excision, uh, you can see the size of the defect. It's uh, more than uh, uh, two centimeters. Vertically also it is uh, more than one centimeters. So uh, in the lower lid, I'm marking six mm from the uh, lateral canthus, uh, a vertical height of around 
uh, uh, six to eight millimeters. It has to be uniform throughout and you should stop at the level of the eyebrow. So first neck is a full thickness neck. Then after that, you um, only cut the skin and orbicularis layer. Identify the LCT, lateral canthal tendon, put, a, uh, put one uh, suture over there so that you ha have in proper position the lateral canthus. This I am cutting the, uh, 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 the uh, septum from the orbital rim. This step is very important and throughout this has to be cut. Then only you can, uh, the flap is free and you can rotate it and cover the coloboma. This I have sutured the lateral canthus. Now uh, in a standard way, I'm uh, doing the coloboma repair as we do with the vertical mattress suture. So after aligning all these uh, tissues, these are all two, three sutures important we have to place. Now I am tightening the lateral canthal tendon. You can see the horizontal palpable aperture. Now I'm suturing the posterior uh, lamella with the uh, orbicularis layer. And uh, here, uh, what I am doing is I am uh, reconstructing the lateral canthus, passing 80 um, vicryl. Uh, from the gray line so that there is no uh, misalignment of the lateral canthal uh, lid. And you can see it's uh, more than, you know, 2.5 centimeters. You can see is the horizontal vertical, horizontal uh, palpable aperture. And here rest of the lid uh, uh, tissue I'm suturing with 6-0 vicryl. This step is very important, removal of the dog ear. And this helps in rotating of the whatever, you know, tissue is there, which has come from the lower lid. This has to be cut just short of the, you know, the, uh, the lid uh, margin and only skin muscle you have to remove, not the full thickness. And then you close it. Though it appears very tight on table, most of the surgeries otherwise are also like tight, but then this gra gradually uh, becomes all right in one to two weeks. These are some uh, pre and post-op pictures you can see on your left hand side, the um, pre-op pictures on left, uh, on the right hand side, you can see after reconstruction. So the beauty of this procedure is that the eyelid uh, coloboma is sutured by eyelid tissue, which has its cilia also, except the one mm of lateral canthus we know is cilia free and it is thin. Rest everything is, you know, same as of the lid. So uh, all the notch, everything generally um, flattens with time. Very minimal complications. Uh, 10 patients um, uh, I have to reported with no flap. necrosis of flap or lymphedema. This is recently operated. If you see closely here, this is a case of BCC. After frozen uh, guided excision, 50% coloboma was there in the lower lid. And then from the upper lid, similar procedure, one month follow up. Though you can appreciate some bogginess of the uh, lower lid and some convexity of the lid and a notch also of lateral canthus, but all these things subside by three to six months time. So take home message is now it's time that we shift from the you know um, two stay surgeries to single stay surgeries where possible. It will avoid the second surgery, early re re recovery is there, early rehabilitation, financial burden is less on the patient, they can go to the job. And in children also there is, uh, you know, less risk of MLIFT. Thank you. Oh, so that was a wonderful uh, talk. And now you all know that if you want to go down in history or you want your name to be there in the ophthalmology books, you need to work on lid reconstruction because the sky is the limit. Uh, it's just your, how much your imagination can go. You can, you know, uh, make your own technique and then you will have your name in the ophthalmology books. Huh? So you all st can start doing that for going down in the on history eh? okay carry on thank you ma'am and now i go on to our uh, one of the young speakers uh, dynamic and very active uh, with us at rp center dr sahil agrawal and he will be talking about uh, orbital trauma keep an eye for the details uh, well, very good evening to everyone uh, at the onset, I would like to thank my mentors, Professor Bajaj, sir, Professor Neelam, and Dr. Rasta, ma'am, from whom I have learned the trade and tricks of oculoplasty today. Uh, I have no financial disclosures for the talk. Orbital trauma comes with quite a devastating injury, uh, along with uh, quite uh, adverse effects in both form and function. Professor Grover, sir, and Dr. Kasturi, ma'am, have already discussed about the uh, orbital fractures in quite extensively. 
I shall be uh, keeping my lecture short to periorbital traumas, intraorbital foreign bodies, and post-orbital uh, post uh, post-traumatic global accessions. Uh, being a tertiary eye care referral center, we get uh, this uh, quite a lot of to manage this extensive eyelid and periorbital traumas. Uh, the primary goal in such cases is adequate eyelid closure and lubrication of the eye surface, thereby preventing the exposure keratopathy and trauma-related com corneal complications. However, due to extensive nature of the damage that has already happened in the periorbital area, raising a flap generally not, is not possible. Also, as, a, uh, as, the, as, as the recipient bed is full with ischemic ish, uh, shard issues, uh, thereby indicating a poor vascularity, a skin graft may primarily fail. Therefore, any attempt to do a definitive reconstruction surgery in such uh, as an emergency procedure is not feasible in such cases. Sometimes if done, they can otherwise result in more damage to the tissues instead. Uh, conventional tarsography also uh, usually gives away in such cases due to increased tension at the wound site or as a result of cheese wiring of the friable tissues. Uh, we have, however, we have noted that in such cases, the postural lamella is relatively less traumatized or is more available to us. So, uh, postural lamellar tarsography can be uh, uh, can come for our rescue in such cases. In, and in a postural lamellar tarsography, the internal postural lamella of the opposing eyelids are separated by splitting the eyelid margin at the gray line in its central part, uh, aiming for closure of at least half of the horizontal aperture. Uh, in cases with damaged eyelid margin, the split can be done at the skin conjunctival junction instead. In the lower eyelid, the dissection is extended deep till the lower border of tarsus, and the flaps are advanced, mobilized by giving medial and la lateral vertical cuts to the lower tarsal border, and they are advanced then. The margins of the lamella are made raw by excising one mm of the margin tissues, and they are brought together and sutured using interrupted 6 or polycorrecting sutures. There are a few of the pre and post-op patients in whom we were able to salvage both anatomically and physiologically the ocular surface. In all of them, the internal lamella was uh, allowed to heal with the secondary intention. And then, however, the definitely reconstructive surgery procedure was done later on. So PLT can be done as an emergency procedure in patients with extensive damage or loss of eyelid tissues, especially where primary repair or reconstructive procedures are not possible. However, we should be very clear that it is not a procedure of choice or other less damaging procedures of tar therapy. Come to the next aspect of orbital trauma, they usually come with orbital foreign bodies and uh, who pose a significant threat to the surrounding structures in the orbit. Uh, the foreign bodies can be of various sizes, types, and cause uh, quite extensive da uh, damage uh, along with the orbit to the penis and interface as well. This is a panorama of few of the foreign bodies that we have encountered, ranging right from the smaller ones, including the newspaper foreign body, a metallic steel rod, a metallic hook, to uh, the moderate ones, including a uh, rifle bullet and the measuring weight of a balance. And still the larger ones, including the clutch of a bike and a large wooden foreign body that has gone right from the orbital space into the uh, nasal cavity and the ethmoid sinuses. And yet a larger, yet, and yet a larger sugarcane foreign body that has gone from the orbital space into the internal canal cavity. All these large foreign bodies require special attention as you need to collaborate a team of ENT, uh, neurosurgery, and uh, uh, ocular plastic uh, surgeon together for a prompt and uh, good management. Also, uh, we need to be watchful in foreign bodies about the organic ones, uh, especially the woody ones, which are linked to high risk of uh, uh, bacterial and fungal infections, inflammatory granuloma formation, and calcification. These wooden foreign bodies tend to have variable density on CT and can be mistaken for intraorbital air in the acute phases. Coming to another aspect of uh, uh, orbital trauma, traumatic globe luxation, which is a rare clinical event. Uh, in it, there is complete protrusion of the eyeball from the orbit with the globe caught between the eyelid apertures. As it carries a risk of permanent visual loss, immediate reduction is warranted. Uh, here, is a... here is a small video showing uh, repositioning of the globe in a luxated uh, newborn child who was brought to us at 18 hours of age. The, uh, it happened due to trauma at delivery. There was a completely prolapsed globe with corneal haze, a diffuse congestion and mid-dilated pupil present. The child was taken up for surgery within four hours of presentation. In all such cases of globe luxation, proper periocular cleaning is must. Um, now the lids are separate, pulled away from the globe using a lens spatula and forceps. And the globe is allowed to slowly prolapse back into the orbit. A similar maneuver is then carried out for the upper lid as well. And this would help us in reposing the globe very well. After proper reposing the globe, a thorough cleaning of both the upper and lower lid should be done so as to prevent any future granulomas or clinical infections. 
also towards the end of the surgery a uh, temporary suture tarsography helps us support the globe in management of uh, globe luxations though uh, the primary focus stays on the luxator globe but we should also keep be watchful about the normal contralateral eye we had this series of uh, four patients in whom uh, in the luxator globe there was no uh, no complete of uh, yeah, yeah, there was no complete transaction of the optic nerve seen however the fourth fourth case had a complete optic nerve transaction uh, present and on the first post operative day a visual field analysis of the first three cases showed us a visual field defect in the contralateral normal eye however it was not present in the one which had complete optic nerve transaction we believe that uh, in a normally positioned globe the optic nerve has a sinusoidal course and any strong deaccession forces causes the uh, against the bony framework causes the globe to move out of the orbit in relation to the static optic nerve and orbital soft tissue complex this could result in either a complete optic nerve transaction or you could have no partial transactions which would cause a stretch all along the optic nerve till the chiasma to this inferior nasal fibers and thereby this visual field defect uh, in the contralateral contralateral line therefore uh, we should be very much watchful about the uh, uh, contralateral normal eye as well in such cases as in patients with monocular vision any limitation of the visual full visual field is significant a perimetry at the earliest possible should also be done in all the such cases to pick up any chiasmal injury thank you for your patient hearing thank you sahil so in these cases with chiasmal injury uh, when do you recommend the visual field uh, for the other eye and okay and uh, have you seen recovery of the visual field uh, effect of the three patients in two of the patients they had recovered visual field uh, almost completely recovered visual field how is it going to be restored much okay so there could be a permanent visual field effect in these cases and i think that's yes i think that's a very important take home message thank you we now have our next speaker again uh, uh, alumnus of rp center very happy to have her here uh, dr palravi singh a very dynamic uh, young lady she is now uh, working under uh, robert uh, uh, dr robert kolberg at steen eye institute university of california she is doing her international fellowship uh, lovely to see you here and have you here palravi uh, you have your talk on aging of the upper third of the face concepts and techniques go yes, on thank you so much for having me uh, i wish i could be at the jln auditorium right now i'm missing all of our oculoplastics team it's really nice to see everyone could you please uh, play my pre recorded talk thank you Good evening, everyone. My name is Pallavi Singh, and I'm the Global Ocular Plastics Fellow here at Steinai Institute, UCLA. I'm very honored to be able to speak at the RPC Foundation Day, since RPC is my alma mater. And I would like to thank my mentors at RPC, uh, Dr. Bajaj, Dr. Neela Pushkar, and Dr. Neel, for this wonderful opportunity. Today, I'm here to talk about aging changes of the upper third of the face. We're going to talk about concepts and techniques for a rejuvenation of the upper third of the face. So here we have a picture of Maharani Gayatri Devi, probably one of the most uh, beautiful women in India. And you can see from her before and after that there is aging, but hopefully at the end of this lecture, we'll be able to objectively pinpoint what those changes are and sort of have an idea of what the techniques are to deal with those changes. So one of the changes that I want to talk about to begin with in the upper third of the face is deflation. Our deflation is loss of soft tissue volume. And it is important to realize that the eyebrow fat pad is the thing that forms, that contributes the most to the upper mid contour. It's important to realize that the eyebrow fat pad changes in different ethnicities, and it's important to be cognizant of this change. You can see here on the left, uh, this is a scan of an Asian eyelid, where you see that there's more of subcutaneous and roof fat pad, which is the retro orbicularis ocular, oculi fat. And on the right, you have uh, the scan of a Caucasian eyelid, where there's not as much of the subcutaneous and the roof fat, but the orbital fat is prominent. So it's important to know where the fat pad is and how it's uh, you know, distributed in different ethnicities to be able to deal with these patients in the best possible manner. Now, what does um, deflation cause? You know, so what we see here that as, as we age and as deflation of the soft tissue happens, you can develop, uh, develop a superior sulcus hollow. There can be prominence of the medial orbital fat pad and there's a deflation of the lateral orbital fat pad. But here we have one. 
uh, known best for her dancing and her beautiful eyes. If you see when she was young, she has, you know, a prevalence of the lateral side fat, but as she aged, even though she has aged gracefully, you can see that there's a little bit of a depletion of that fat fat. And that's one of the more uh, prominent features that you see in her face. Now, one of the other things that I want to talk to you about is that when we're looking at the shape of the eyebrow, we have to be uh, not distracted by the eyebrow hairs. If you can see here on the left and the right, essentially the shape of our eyebrow is the same. It's just that the eyebrow hairs are different. So it's important to understand that the eyebrow shape is because of the roof fat and not because of the eyebrow hairs. Let the eyebrow hairs not distract you. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And one of the other things that I want to talk about is that you have to be sort of aware of the differences of the shape of the upper eye, uh, of the upper eyelid between males and females. In males, a fuller upper eyelid is kind of a natural look, you know. So if you see this gentleman here when he was young, he had a fuller upper eyelid, which is a natural look for males. And after undergoing what we would call a traditional blepharoplasty, you know, there's a hollowing out, there's increased tarsal platform show, which might not necessarily be the best change for males, you know, it's probably a good change for women. So it's important to be aware of these changes, you know, these differences between men and women when we're dealing with the upper third of the face. Also, one of the things that I want to talk about is that patients come to us with problems that they see. Like this lady came to us saying that she has excess skin. But if you look at her pictures from before, you realize that there's not as much redundant skin as there is loss of soft tissue in the upper eyelid. So it's important to listen to the patients, but it's also important to be able to objectively define what their problem is, which might not necessarily always be what they're talking about. And so one of the techniques that we use here at UCLA, um, you know, Dr. Goldberg uses for the Asian island especially, uh, is uh, subbrow blepharoplasty with dermal stacking, which essentially sort of retains and even augments the volume of the superior sulcus hollow and gives them a more rejuvenated look. One of the other things that we can, uh, you know, do to deal with the superior sulcus hollow is fill it either with fat or with fillers. In this case, this gentleman had 0.5 cc of filler and on both the sides. And you can see it looks much more natural and you know, more rejuvenated as compared to the superior sulcus hollow that he had earlier. The other change that I want to talk about is skin uh, redundancy. It's one of the changes that we most commonly talk about. Uh, essentially, doing the skin only blepharoplasty, what it does is that it increases the tarsal platform show. And if you can see here, this increased task for tarsal that control is closer to what you know, this lady used to look like when she was younger. So removing the tissue, you know, doing the skin only that is a great uh, technique to use in patients who have filled, uh, who have you know full tissues, they have minimal deflation. Doing the skin only blepharoplasty in these cases and give them a very well rested and rejuvenated look. The next thing that I want to talk about is dry dance. Uh, when we talk about dragons, uh, people talk about static and dynamic dragons. Uh, but my mentor here, Dr. Goldberg, says that when we're talking about dragons, we're talking about dynamic dragons because they occur when the muscles move. And so to be able to take care of these, we have to make the muscles not move, you know, paralyze the muscles. And to be able to paralyze the muscles, we have one of our own people to thank, uh, Dr. Scott, you know, the ophthalmologist who came up with botulinotoxin uh, for strabismus. Uh, and all of us use, you know, neurotoxin to paralyze the face all the time. But I think the most important thing to sort of be aware of when we're doing this is, of course, to know what the anatomy of the face is, to know where the muscles are getting inserted, how the muscles are acting. But I think more important than that is to be able to customize the pattern of neurotoxin for all of these patients. That's, that's how you're going to be able to give your patients the best kind of result, cookie cutter. A cookie cutter approach is not the way to go about this. Like in this patient, you know, we would usually do like three spots or two units each for crow's feet. But this lady has a wide expanse of the orbicularis. So when we customize the pattern of neurotoxin to her, we can get the best possible result. I think that's the thing that we need to sort of know in our heads. Just to round it off, the other aging change that we see um, in the upper third of the face is the grouping of the eyelids which is because of uh, aponeurotic dehiscence. And just to show here that a simple dosis surgery can also give patients a very rejuvenated and well-rested look. Coming to the last thing that I want to talk about, which is probably one of the most important things because we don't really pay as much attention to it, is uh, the skin texture, you know, fine lines and wrinkles. And these things, uh, you know, are changes that cannot be taken care of surgically. 
So what we do for these uh, changes, you know, skin texture changes is we can use lasers, we can use peels such as glycolic acid, and even ask patients to use, you know, exfoliants at home. And just doing the, you know, this is a pre and post of a lady who underwent laser, and you can see the tremendous amount of difference, you know, just addressing the skin changes can make. So just to sort of be able to objectively define what uh, the aging changes are, you know, getting, going back to where we started from, you can see here that there's a little bit of deflation of the lateral fat pad. You can see that there's skin redundancy, her tarsal platform shows lower as she age now as compared to when she was younger. You can see that, you know, brightens have developed and the eyelid is at the lower position. There's some amount of ptosis and there are skin texture changes. So to summarize, uh, I guess what we need to understand is aging is a multifactorial process. Now, there are many changes that come together to sort of lead to it. So it's important to have a holistic approach. It's important to address all of these changes when we're looking at aging. And especially when it comes to the upper eyelid, I feel like deflation is one of the most important changes that we need to be aware of. And removing tissue might not always be the best option. I would like to thank Dr. Goldberg and Dr. Rolos for helping me with this presentation. And I would like to invite you all to the annual blepharoplasty course we do here at this year. It's going to be right after the academy this year. I'm really looking forward to seeing you all in LA. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pallavi. That was really a wonderful talk. And I'm very really happy to see your lovely smile too. Uh, is she still there? Thank you, ma'am. I am. I think I'm unable to start my video. I think the host has to enable um, starting the video. So I was just wondering if a 60-year-old lady wants to look like a 40-year-old, how many surgeries do you think would be required? <laughs> That's a very good question, ma'am. But I think the one thing that I've learned in all the time I've spent here is expectation management. So the first thing you tell the 60-year-old lady is that you're not going to make her a 40-year-old. You you will tell her that you will make her the best version of the 60-year-old. So, yeah. I think yeah and... Uh... Yeah, Palvi, so that was a wonderful talk. And uh, when you come back to India, we'll be hoping that you'll get that magic potion with you Hopefully. to prevent aging huh? because we don't want to get all the, into all these surgeries and all. So just get that wonder drug with you. Huh? Okay. That, absolutely. That is That has been my one single goal of being here in the United States okay. to get back youth to India. It's yeah, really nice. A sample of that from you. <laughs> Thank you, Palavi. And with that, we go on to our uh, yet uh, another young, beautiful and talented uh, ex-RPC alumnus, uh, sorry, RPC alumnus, Dr. Maya Hada. She's working uh, at uh, SMS uh, Medical College, Jaipur. Uh, she's assistant professor and works in oculoplasty and ocular oncology. She would be giving a talk on another trauma series. So be ready for those photographs that we just saw in Sire's presentation. So periorbital trauma and case scenarios. On to you, Maya. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm so much missing to be there. And it's always a pleasure uh, to be a part of the celebration of my alma mater. I am forever indebted to my teachers. And these are my memories at RP Center. So today, again, I'm going to talk about uh, periorbital trauma. And I will be discussing a few uh, simple cases. And there will be one tip associated with each case. So my first case was a 28-year-old male. He had a road traffic accident uh, two months back. And uh, he presented to me with unrepaired eyelid laceration of the upper and lower lid, probably because of a lot of chemosis at that time. And now the cornea was getting exposed and strobal thinning was there. So I tried doing a tarsorephy, but it doesn't last for long. But it helped me to stretch the tissues a little bit. And I would like to state here that eyelid are very elastic structures and they retract uh, so that we feel that the tissue defect is la uh, large, but in uh, actually it's not that large and we can always uh, realign them anatomically and reoppose them. So I'll cut short the video in the interest of time. I was able to excise the uh, lower uh, lid scar and realign the tissues and was able to form the lower eyelid in this case. However, the upper eyelid defect was much larger and direct opposition was not feasible. So I had to uh, do a kind of a tensile advancement here. 
and uh, then a sufficient upper eyelid was formed to cover the eyeball and protect the cornea from further damage. So at the end of the surgery, patient was able to close the eyelid completely. And this is the post-operative photograph. So the tip associated with uh, this case is that meticulous anatomical realignment after scar excision can be achieved in unrepaired and delayed presentation of the eyelid laceration. My second case was a young male with dog bite, which was 10 days back, and he had a lower lid laceration along with the canalicular involvement. So again, we tend to repair the canaliculus within 24 to 48 hours of presentation usually, but it was more than a week of the injury. And the other thing was that the canaliculus was torn at around 10 millimeters from the punctum, which was quite distal. And I was uh, able to locate the distal torn end of the canaliculus, but it was very difficult for me to identify it. So I took help of the opposite punctum and I injected the betadine solution. And here in the depth of the medial canthus, I can see the torn end of the uh, canaliculus, which was confirmed with the probing. And after that, the uh, monocanalicular stent was inserted into the uh, both the ends of the canaliculus and approximation of the pericanalicular tissue was done uh, in two layers. So here the uh, tip uh, associated with this case is the canalicular repair can be attempted even if the presentation is little late, more than a week, and injecting a colored fluid from opposite punctum provides good assistance in locating the medial content. So the third case is of young male. He had history of fall and protrusion of the left eye for two weeks and a very classical boat shaped appearance of uh, orbital subperiosteal hematoma was there. So in the OPD procedure room, I inserted an 18 gauge needle and with the 10 ml syringe, I was able to aspirate around seven to eight ml of uh, the dark colored fluid and the proptosis resolved on table. So the tip is early diagnosis can lead to uh, prompt management and a needle aspiration is a simple technique for such cases. This lady had a recurrent swelling and purulent discharge in the right eye for last three months. And uh, she was even advised DCR at uh, some place. And uh, she gave me a history that she had a trauma with a wooden stick that is a uh, baboon stem while cutting. Uh, but there was no entry wound which was visible. So I ordered an MRI and here I can see that a hypo intense linear shadow is present in the orbit. And this was confirmed intraoperatively where a four centimeter long babool stem was retrieved uh, through the transconjunctival approach just above the eyeball. So a uh, very high index of suspicion is needed, particularly if the inflammation is not resolving with antibiotics and there is a discharging sinus present. This lady, uh, while watching the Shara celebration, she got an impacted iron nail, and which was appearing to be very straight case, but she was having RAPD and uh, very low finger counting vision. And on imaging, we can see that it's not that straight uh, what it appeared clinically, and it was going posterior to the eyeball and was indenting over the uh, eyeball from posterior aspect. There was disc edema, choroidal folds, and on the nasal aspect, there was subretinal hemorrhage and localized RD, which was suggestive of a reverse scleral perforation from the posterior sharp edge of the foreign body. So uh, after the foreign body removal, the fundus changes recovered. And the tip associated with this case is that fundus examination is must in all cases of foreign bodies as they can have unusual path in the orbit. Uh, some foreign bodies, Sahil has already discussed. I won't go into the details. And this was very strange foreign body. The patient was harboring it for uh, around 25 years. And it came out to be just an encerclage band. And it was a painful blind eye. I was amazed at what it is, but it was just a scleral uh, band, which was done 25 years back in this case. So organic foreign bodies, they have to be removed. Metallic foreign bodies, if they are accessible, they should be removed. If they are not causing any uh, functional deficit and they are posteriorly located, we can leave them. To conclude, uh, my talk was directed towards general ophthalmologists. They must be aware of the clinical radiological features of orbital emergencies like hematoma foreign bodies for the prompt management or referral and the better outcomes. 
I thank you again for having me a part of this August uh, meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maya. So uh, in that uh, case where you did the repair after seven days and you were able to identify the canaliculus, how was the outcome? Was, uh, was the repair, uh, I mean, successful in terms of a canalicular uh, repair? Yes, ma'am. The anatomical as well as the functional outcome, patient is asymptomatic till date. Uh, it's been an uh, eight-month follow-up now. That's wonderful because normally we read that it is possible only within the first three days or so if the patient presents to you at that time. Yes. So that, that was wonderful. Uh, we now have our next speaker, uh, Dr. Mukesh Sharma, uh, so as a medical director of Center for Sight at Jaipur and also president-elect for Jaipur Ophthalmology Society. And he would be talking on lacrimal surgeries, uh, a, a vast video-assisted uh, session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's indeed honor and the privilege to be there in your own alma mater and, uh, and to whom I owe everything as an ophthalmologist. So my talk would be a little deviation in the session. I would be talking about very simple lacrimal procedures. Uh, uh, and straight away, uh, I have included this particular uh, thing, Trigler's massage also in my talk, because I have seen if you talk to five ophthalmologists, everybody will describe you how to give a Trigler's massage differently. So what is the proper way of giving Trigler's massage? Uh, ideally, one should stabilize the head by holding it from other hand and then your finger nail should point towards the cornea and your finger should also uh, cover up the lid upper eyelid and then you press over the lacrimal sac area and move your finger downward so your finger nail should point towards the cornea and your finger itself will create closure of uh, eyelid and then you will have to press over the sac area. So very simple thing, but I think we must tell all the parents to do it properly to have a good result. Then I will be discussing about probing in congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. You should have your trolley with appropriate instrumentation and it should always be done under general anesthesia. Intubation is not mandatory, but one should be ready for intubation if need arises. Lubrication is necessary in case of a child because you may damage the punctum. Also, you should not be using too thin probes because you may create false passage there. So a zero or a one zero or one number probe is good. Then uh, proper direction of probe has to be there. We all know about it. But one thing is that uh, once you have uh, uh, gone through the obstruction, then do a gentle reaming motion and always never introduce or never insert probe more than 4 cm. Because we know that our nasolacrimal duct uh, NLD system, uh, in total, it is around 32 to 35 mm. I have seen people introducing more than 4 cm of probe and by in turn, they pierce the floor of nose and enter into the nose. So you should never insert more than four centimeter of probe uh, to avoid unnecessary trauma. And also never use broken needle cannulas. Always try to have a good round customary cannulas. Now congenital lacrimal fistula. This is congenital lacrimal fistula. If these fistulas are not associated with nasolacrimal duct obstruction, then it is good to do a fistulectomy only. Uh, Dr. Ghosh has taught us this there. And this is a wonderful, simple procedure. You can see fluid coming out uh, with this. So you just make an elliptical incision all around the fistula, hold the fistula by forceps or by attraction suture, and uh, go up to the opening, dissect up to the opening of fistula track into the sac. It will become pear shaped there. Then pass a purse string 6 or suture all around the fistula track and then excise and tighten your uh, purse string suture. So uh, never ever you will have reopening of fistula track if you do it properly. 
so only two two steps are uh, necessary here dissecting the fistula stack deep uh, till it become pear shaped uh, enter into the sac and then passing of a pursing suture all round then we come to the watering in adults there are various procedures for punctal stenosis uh, we do repeated dilatation and then uh, punctal snipping if it is not successful for proximal canalicular obstruction less than 8 mm nowadays we do trephination with mini monoca stent if uh, this is a failure then you can go for conjunctive or dcr and for distal canalicular obstruction more than 8 mm canalicular dcr with intubation is done and of course for nldo we do dcr so for punctal stenosis you can see uh, you uh, can hardly see punta here but just uh, uh, blindly at the location of punta on lacrimal papilla you do uh, some dissection with the help of 26 gauze needle just try to remove the cut through the membrane which is there over the puncta and then dilate it with the help of punctum dilator and then pass your uh, lacrimal probe in this particular case we were lucky there there was no other obstruction present in the canaliculus so here uh, a syringing was done and it was found to be patent now we know that uh, this puncta will again close down so a three snip procedure was done in this particular case one snip with the help of vana then again second snip and third snip just to remove that part of punctum so conjunctival side of puncta is removed again patency is confirmed and then mini monoca stent is placed inside the uh, canalicular system so a simple procedure but gratifying results are obtained in more, most cases this mini monoca stent may extrude out after some time but even if it is there for two weeks or so your purpose would be solved then proximal canalicular obstruction less than 8 mm canalicular refination with mini monoca stent so here uh, the obstruction was there at 5 to 6 mm you can see here so sisler strefine was used and this obstruction was negotiated by uh, simple screwing motions i am so sorry to interrupt you sir uh, this is a very simple procedure but it may have little higher uh, failure rate uh, 50 to 60% success rate is there in our hand like late uh, closer are there but you can repeat it two to three times and uh, eventually you get good results i'm so sorry to again, interrupt dr mukesh once you uh, have removed the obstruction you will up, uh, introduce the mini monoca stent into the system so uh, i'll not discuss the external dcr i think because i am already uh, i think overshot the time thank you thank you for your patience here thank you so much sir uh, very very valid points actually we see so many patients who come with the doing the massage already but in a completely wrong fashion and which uh, i think needs to be emphasized uh, whenever we are talking about the lacrimal drainage problems and uh, uh, 
Uh, sir, one question. So if uh, in cases of stenosis, uh, the punctal stenosis, do you also uh, recommend just a punctal dilatation? And if that is so, how often would uh, that have to be repeated uh, in case the punctum dilates with the dilator? How often would you advise a repetition and uh, for how long? Pre-weekly uh, dilatation, I, I prefer that regime and at least three times. Three uh, weekly, three times. Three at so, least three weekly, uh, three times and three weekly. Three weekly, yeah. And if it does not success, uh, uh, get successful, then I resort to uh, this three three snip procedure. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We now have our last speaker for the session, uh, Dr. Anita Sethi. Uh, Ma'am is also a, a passer of RP Center, and she is currently working as uh, at Fortis Advanced Eye Care Center. And uh, I am happy to say that she has started plaque brachytherapy there and also intra-arterial chemotherapy for retinoblastoma. That's a very good news, Ma'am. And I welcome you for your talk, COVID and orbital mucor management of the deadly duo. Thank you, Dr. Rachna. Thank you, Dr. Neelam. Thank you, Dr. Bajaj. It's such an honor and a privilege to be back at Alma Mater uh, participating in RPC Day. So many memories come back. So, um, yeah, I'm going to keep it short. It's not easy being the last speaker when the rest of the speakers have had such wonderful presentations, but I really just want to share. We all went through a very hard time when... Um, COVID, uh, the second wave, and I'm sure all of us dealt with a lot of uh, muca cases. And I'm just sharing my experience. I mean, I think raised a lot of questions and it's not that muca is something new, but in um, 20 years of experience, I had seen two cases and managed two cases of muca. And now in that one year, we had almost 30 cases of muca for us to manage. So it was really hard. And um, we know that the Delta variant was particularly aggressive. Uh, and the reason why we saw so many muca cases is because it not only uh, decreased the nasal um, immunity, allowed the muca to progress, also attacked the pancreas, um, so precipitated diabetes. Also, we had to give steroids, again, precipitating diabetes and basically giving muca a really good uh, playground. Orbital, it reaches the orbit from the nose and sinuses, from all the fissures, uh, lamina, papricia, and orbital fissures. Also, the thrombotic effect um, uh, led to orbital apex syndrome. Many of our patients presented with orbital apex syndrome, central retinal artery uh, occlusion. And we, um, the clinical features, unfortunately, the eye signs are late and mostly it comes from the ENT um, uh, colleagues. And the most probable profile that we saw, all our patients were diabetic, either undiagnosed or uncontrolled. And uh, most of them came to us post COVID two to three weeks. And we managed them with a MUCA team um, in which the ENT surgeon, the infectious disease specialist uh, were a very important part. And I think I became honorary ENT surgeon and honorary radiologist because I was forever with them. And the, I, by the end of it, the ENT surgeons could do the um, excentrations without me. The diagnosis um, was important. And um, we started uh, doing the KOH swabs in the ER itself and did manage to get about 25 to 30% uh, positive. Without the positive biopsy or smear, we couldn't order uh, amphotericin because the Gurgaon, I mean, the Haryana government was really strict. We just couldn't get sufficient doses of um, amphotericin B. Um, the inflammatory markers were not of much help, so we really needed the nasal biopsy to get it. Uh, radiology was very important for our diagnosis, for our ex seeing the extent and monitoring. The ENT colleagues preferred CT, but we needed a CT PNS with a brain and orbital window to be able to pick up the early muca cases. You can see um, diffuse fat stranding, which is very uh, early sign. You could pick it up in the CT, but the MR was definitely um, 
earlier, you could pick it up earlier. So this was just a subtle proptosis and a straightening of the optic nerve. So you were able to pick up um, things uh, earlier with the MR. So what were the MR signs of fungal infection? T2, it would be hypo intense, like a hemorrhage. And you can see here, even the vitreous, uh, the muscle is um, muscular enlargement was also seen easier on MR, the black turbinate sign. And um, the contrast, the optics, so this is the non-contrast and this is with the contrast. So it very clearly showed you the optic nerve nerve involvement and the optic nerve sheath. Of course, intracranial extension, we had many patients with superior or orbital vein infiltration, uh, cavernous sinus involvement. So um, the MR picked up the signs quite uh, well. So what were our learnings? Our learnings, yes, the MR was very good for initial diagnosis and maybe for looking at some amount of the extent. But we found that the clinical improvement was ahead of the radiological clearing because the granulation tissue also uh, enhanced. So it was not a good tool for trying to decide when to stop your treatment or when to change your treatment. And we found that the CNS involvement that we saw, dural enhancement, small infarcts, they were not good prognostic factors. And I'll just show it in a couple of cases. And of course, we needed a high index of suspicion to pick up the early signs. The antifungal uh, drugs are the cornerstone of treatment for muca. And we had great difficulty getting both amphotericin B. Uh, availability was a problem. And lip liposomal ampho was also very difficult to get, though it's less toxic. It's very expensive. And we've all used this as IV inf uh, infusions, local irrigation, and retrovalvular injections. So really, the lifesavers were the second-line drugs, which is posaconazole and isavoconazole. These drugs were relatively easier to get. And I think many of the patients' lives were saved because they were at least able to get these drugs. So transcutaneous retrovalvular amphotericin B, this was something new for us. We hadn't ever done it before. It is an off-label use. And um, we did it, we used both amphotericin B and liposomal um, amphotericin. Of course, since it was new, how many injections, what is your endpoint? It was a lot of trial and error for many people. Um, I, I just used it in eight patients and we did two to five injections. All our patients had an orbital apex syndrome. Most of them were negative. Of these eight patients, five survived, two died. So um, it's not that we can say that these injections were sort of life-saving, but I'll just, um, in two examples, so this lady, um, she was 68 years with multiple systemic problems. Um, she had an orbital apex syndrome with proptosis, chemosis, and she was too sick for exenteration. So we gave her um, these um, injections because we couldn't give her do an exenteration because she couldn't tolerate amphotericin B. So she was on the second line um, drugs. And each time we gave the injection, she would actually get a little like, reaction, proptose, um, chemosis. And um, she was very unhappy with us for giving the injections. But um, six months or five months down the line, she actually recovered. And uh, there's no proptosis, sorry. There's no proptosis. The ocular movements came back. And um, uh, though the vision didn't come back, she was definitely much better. So it's good that she wasn't able to get undergo the excentration. Now, this is another gentleman who also had an orbital apex syndrome. After three uh, injections, there was not much improvement. And the MRI was showing dural enhancement. And we were suspecting an intracranial spread. So we actually took him up for excentration. In his histopath, we found fungal elements only at the apex, no necrosis, um, no inflammation now, whether it was because of our injections or whether he was anyway a different kind of a case. So we don't know. So our learning is that it is a use, useful adjunctive modality, but can we give it instead of exenteration? Does it save an exenteration? And we don't know. Standardization, dosage and all, we don't know. We have to work that out. Just a quick two uh, more slides on uh, the uh, pathology. We found uh, all the patients had infiltration and fungal elements at the apex. However, only two of the patients had intraocular. So there was actually fungus inside the retina, intraretinal, which was uh, in two of the patients. And two of them had in the conjunctiva and also in the sclera. So the fungus actually did penetrate intraocular, intra which was a bit surprising. 
So what about the, how do we decide on the prognosis? So now this was a patient who was very sick. He had abscess, he had uncontrolled, um, uh, undiagnosed um, diabetes, and um, he had um, cavernous sinus uh, involvement, dural enhancement. This is his maxillary nerve also enhancing. So we actually thought he just didn't have a chance. And, but we still said, let's give him a chance. And we did a maxillectomy and an exenteration for him. And most surprising, nobody expected him to survive, but eight months post-op, he's actually alive and well, unfortunately, a very disfiguring um, a deformity, but at least alive and well. So we don't know about the prognosis. It's probably a combination. And to summarize, in these kind of uh, COVID and um, MUCA, we need to have a very high index of suspicion to pick the cases up early and urgently need to be managed by the whole team and multimodal uh, therapy. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so much has happened in the COVID times and this uh, uh, epidemic of uh, uh, COVID-associated mucormycosis was something which gave an opportunity to all of us to explore the role of intraorbital amphotericin B injections. And I think a lot of people have tried these injections, but uh, we are really not sure what is actually going to come out of it. All of us know that where there are only neurological symptoms, often they do recover on their own, even in patients where we've just given systemic, uh, because that was something that our ENT uh, colleagues also questioned when we started giving uh, intraorbital injections. Uh, we've at our center also given uh, injections in around 20 or so patients where we deemed them, uh, uh, we thought it was possible to save uh, uh, the eye and uh, more than 50% did have a salvage of vision. But how much of it was actually due to intraorbital amphotericin B, we are not really sure because the orbital debulking also was done along with the, uh, the sinus debridement. So uh, hard to say, but yes, I think as the data emerges from various centers, probably we'll be able to say something uh, about the role uh, of intraorbital amphotericin B. Um, uh, with that, I think we come to an end of today's session, the first day of the two-day scientific uh, program here. I would like Dr. Bajaj, uh, Professor Bajaj to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Rachna. So I would like to thank everyone. It was such a good, good uh, uh, you know, uh, experience to meet all our friends, Dr. Millen, Dr. Kasturi, Dr. Urmil Chavla is there, Dr. Grover, our senior. It is a really wonderful experience. And then it's we are overwhelmed by the love and affection of uh, all our alumni who have trained in our unit and now they are doing so well. They are, uh, you know, uh, uh, teachers and uh, uh, consultants in their own right. So I really, it's very overwhelming to see all of them here under one in, on, on this platform. Uh, really, it is a, really a good, uh, very overwhelming experience for all of us. Okay. And we are really thankful to all of them. Thank you, everyone. I, I, I think I would like to thank once again on behalf of RP Center that all of you were here, here celebrating with us the birth centenary of uh, our beloved Dr. L.P. Agarwal, late Dr. L.P. Agarwal on the 55th RPC Foundation Day. So happy and grateful that you could all be here today. And I thank again all our speakers, yeah, teachers, seniors, and everyone. Dr. Bitheria, sir, uh, would you uh, want to say a few words? Uh, I invite I you will, to. Yeah. I, I, I would like to uh, give you some uh, important tips. One for Dr. Maya Hada. She has put this betadine. So I, because whenever you put any colored dye, you know, there is a lot of extravasation and tissue staining can be there. So best thing is to inject air and keep some saline there in the medial canthal area so that you can see the air bubbles coming out of the medial cut end of the canaliculus. That is called as original Morrison's technique. 
the other tip which i want to give to mukesh mukesh told that uh, he wants to use size 10 or one pro mukesh you have to understand that for a child when you are doing probing from the upper pangtam the probe which is zero or one will not go into the pangtam of that child so the best thing is that it should be a snugly fitting probe and to my mind you should use two zero probe or at the most three zero probe three zero and two zero these are the two sizes of the probe which you should use for doing congenital lacrosystatis probing and syringing regarding kriglers massage only thing we have to tell to the patient is that they must occlude both the pangta and idea is not to do regurgitation from the pangtam idea is to push the uh, whatever secretions are there you have to push those secretions after closing both the pangta downwards because the uh, problem is at the lower end of the nasolacrimal duct which you want to open by just blowing the horn in the and creating a positive pressure in the lacrimal system i think these are some of the points i would certainly go for two zero probe which to my mind will not cause any false passage and which will be nicely accommodated first you try 30 you have to select only two choice 30 probe or 20 probe all these things should be clear in the mind of the surgeon otherwise you know surgical mind has to be absolutely clear and step by step that will only make you good thank you very much for listening to me thank you so much sir it's always the simplest of things that we tend to overlook and i think that is where the teachers will uh, always tell us uh, to be careful other, thank other you so one much more point, one more point i want to make for mukesh mukesh for using stenosis of the pangta for this three snip operation etc you have to pass the vana scissor into the punctal area otherwise how will you do snip so it is very important that you must first make some place to put your vana scissor and then only you will be able to make those snips the idea this the first thing mukesh said was correct that at the site of the punctum you just make a cut and then try and find out if you can do something of a snip operation otherwise it is very very difficult and this trifination etc these are all blind procedures and you may be successful in just uh, 20% cases and you may say that it is successful in 80% cases so this is all wrong to my mind trifination etc success rate will be very poor so let us be practical don't be become theory theoretician because in plastic surgery you have to be practical and result oriented your theory and showing beautiful slides does not help the patient at all this is very very important thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir i would also like to acknowledge the presence of dr urmil chavla uh, she was here with us today as a panelist thank you ma'am and so much. dr manu saini i didn't see dr seema das um, uh, if she she's there i'd like to thank her also and uh, with that i think we'll conclude today's sen- session uh, uh, yeah one thing if i'm allowed to say please uh, please go ahead please just go ahead, to, uh, uh, regarding dr anita ma'am's talk it was a very nice talk and myself also being nodal officer at pgi rohtak we dealt with around 290 patients of mucor and we also i was in constant touch with neelam ma'am also in those days and he used to consult and tram really helped in lot of patients ma'am like we could uh, we have follow up right now also many patients recovered to one or two line of vision ocular movements proptosis a lot of patients did recover so tram definitely is there to stay if, hopefully muka should not come back but tram is definitely Uh, was very helpful and it should not be taken lightly it was really good that's nice experience thank, thank you so Re- much rachna may i may i thank uh, the uh, hosts 
the RPC Oculoplastic Faculty for on behalf of all the alumni for this wonderful opportunity to be here at this uh, wonderful occasion and would like to compliment them for this wonderful session. Also, my best wishes to RP Center to continue to be our leader and our teacher and our, to convey our indebtedness forever. And of course, our homages to the founder, Professor L.P. Agarwal, whose perseverance and persistence lifted ophthalmology to a level in this country, which is best, which is the best, which is next to no one. And all that credit goes to Professor L.P. Agarwal and the Rajendra Prasad Center. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Fantastically facilitated session by Dr. Rachna. And thanks to all our speakers and our chairpersons for the wonderful talks. So before concluding, I would request everyone to please turn on their cameras for an e-group photograph. So let's say cheese. I would request the AV team to please. Perfect. So let's say cheese. Great. So ladies and gentlemen, with this, we come to the end of day one, 55th RPC Annual Foundation Day celebrations at RP Center. This is your host, Diksha Rana, signing off for the day. We'll see you again tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. IST time. Till then, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, sir. Good night. So, I hope it was a great inspiration for all of you, our now current senior residents and the ones you know who are still doing their residency, to see the, the you know the proof of the pudding in what our people are able to achieve. So, I hope you will do a better job and make the best of your time. Huh? Go a little further off.